and I don't even need to stop and take a drink of water. I just keep going and going and going. I got like 33 years in my head of traveling and stories, and, but I'm not going to do that to you. No. We'll go a couple hours. We'll do some question and answer. We'll play it by ear. But you'll be fired up because you're with a group of people that are like-minded. You're thinking, yeah, this is good. This is true. Maybe you heard something on the news last night or this morning. You'll hear it later. that will verify and confirm some of the concerns you may have had or based on what I said. And then you'll be thinking, yeah, we got to do this. Okay, we're leaving here, honey, and we're going to Costco. <laughs> How much room's on the card? <laughs> what are you talking about? No, no, we're getting pallets of ketchup and pickles, and I don't want to store the stuff up. I don't want to freeze-dried stuff. I want the stuff in a can and a jar. And then a few days will go by, and this will very easily just fizzle out. And it really can. It can very easily all fizzle out. And when it gets harder, when you have to make decisions on things and you gotta you know, push the button, pull the lever, pull the trigger on buying this or doing this or committing to this, and then you start going, I don't know, do we really need that? Uh, I don't know, maybe, you know, I talked to my friend down the street, you know what he said? Hey, we're all gonna die from something. So who cares? Let's go have a beer. You know, there are people that have that mindset. Don't prep. Hey, if Russia launches or North Korea, you know, or if Iran decides to, you know, you know, bring back the 12th Imam by causing an apocalyptic disaster? I'm good, man, because God knows I love him. All right, that's you, that's fine. I was at a family uh, gathering one time, husband and wife sitting there at the dining room table. He's standing behind her kind of, so she's here. He's like this, yeah, listen, and I'm talking. And at one point, she made some comment about, yeah, if someone breaks in the house, you know, I, I want to feel safe. I said, yeah, you should. You should be able to feel safe, you know? Uh, we'll call her Susan, we'll call him Bill. All right, and, uh, and Susan says, you want to feel safe? Yeah, you should, you know, because they come in and it could be a threat. And it gets to the point when she says, yeah, I just, I mean, I want to do the right thing. And, he, and, and, and Bill's standing back here, and Bill says, hey, you know what? I'm going to say, Grace, man, if God wants to take me, I'm ready to go. So if someone breaks in the house and takes me, I'm good with that. Susan's sitting here looking at me like this. Because you know what she's thinking, ladies, right? She's thinking, what about me? You're my husband, you're my knight in shining armor, right? And the funny thing about it is after a few moments, I went back and I kind of addressed it, tried to do it tactfully. Hey, you know, Bill, earlier when you were talking about being ready to go, that's awesome, man, because we all should be. Yeah. Whether it's car accidents, sickness, or a plane falls out of the sky and lands on you, <laughs> all right? Whatever happens, you want to be ready to go. Well, when you're gone and there's bad guys in the house, what happens to Susan? And his reaction was, Oh, <laughs> yeah. Her reaction was, yeah. You know, and those moments happen a lot. And they've been married, I don't know, 15, whatever years, 20 years at the time. And my point behind that is we are here for each other. We're here to help each other get through this stuff as well. And it's, it's, it's in both sides of it. I mean, what we can bring to the table as men and women in a crisis situation is unreal. It's like the situation I told you last night. But did I tell you about the car accident, the, the guy in the parking lot last night? I didn't, I've talked to some people, I forget what I said to who. The guy who hit the head? Yeah. Okay. And, and so I'm here trying to organize this, and I'm shouting, and I'm running, and this and that, and then the nurse comes over, and she jumps in. We didn't know who each other was. We were both able to come together and bring something to the table and help the guy at that moment. Right? Here's another story, interesting. I'm at a parking lot at Menards. Do you know Menards up here? Yeah. Okay. I'm at Menards. And, you know, hanging out there, get on my truck, and I'm, I'm, this is years ago, and I'm walking the parking lot, and it's five in the afternoon, whatever it is, and a minivan's kind of slowly driving by, and there's a guy on the passenger side, his, his, turns out his wife was driving it very slowly through the parking lot, and he's got his hand in the handle, and he's yelling, my hand's in the door, come on, stop it, my hand's in the door. And she stops the vehicle, and I come around and look, this is one of those moments where everything goes orange, right? You got a crisis situation, so you start focusing on it. So I come around and pay attention, and he's yelling at me. Come on! Open the door, let me in! His hand wasn't stuck in the door. He was just holding inside the handle. Yeah, he was trying to get her shut, or just stop the car and open the door. Open the door, let me in! Come on! What's the matter with you? And I walk up, and I'm like this far from the guy. So I'm in a distance on purpose, where if he were to pull a knife, I've got a couple of feet to do something. But I'm also close enough that if a gun were to come out, hopefully I can get in on the barrel. Okay. So I'm going through that in my head, the stuff I've been taught, right? I'm like, okay, get in this posture, be ready to go, get the 80 20. Hey, is everything cool, man? He looks over me right away. Oh, um, yeah, tone changes like that, right? And I look at her and I look in the back seat. There's two little kids in the seat. 
She's back in the, in the driver's side with her head down. Hey, are you sure everything's cool here? Ma'am, is everything all right? Now, at this point, another guy sees this. And this guy comes walking over. He's like, like could you stand up, sir, for a second? Because you're tall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw you mask, so I'll stand behind you. <laughs> this is very similar to what it was like. I'm standing here, and a guy this size walks over, and I look at him. He looks at me. We both kind of nod. He's my backup now. And it was like that. Thank you. It was like that. We just knew there was something wrong here. We both came in on it. We both came to the table. I look at him. He looks at me. There's that little, uh-huh. Oh, yeah. I look at the lady, and I say, ma'am, are you sure everything's okay? She just kind of looks at me, and I said to the guy, you got to calm down. you got kids in here. Don't let this escalate into something that, that could get nasty here. Ma'am, are you okay? She wouldn't say anything. I said, there's two of us out here, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we're together on this, right? There's two of us out here. We're not leaving until you tell us you're fine. And she just kind of looked over, and the look on her face, I kid you not, was, oh. And why do you think she felt that way? Because help was there. Help was there. Yeah. there was hope. And where did the hope come from? There was a plan of action that was taking place in the face of this crisis. That's one of the quotes we love at the BRC. Hope is found when you've got a plan of action in the face of a crisis. She felt like, oh no, I'm in trouble. And then a guy comes over and says, hey, are you okay? There's two of us out here. And she looks and sees, and she's thinking, okay, all right. And she says to her husband, I'm not talking to you right now. we got to calm down. We'll talk about this later. Oh, come on, baby. Just open the door. Just let me in. His tone changes 180 degrees. Because there's two guys standing out here basically saying, be nice. That's kind of what we were saying, right? And so she finally says, yeah, yeah, I'll be okay. Thank you very much, sir. All right, you sure? Yeah, okay. Sir, just calm down and just, just work this out, man. You got kids. You got a wife. You got to work this out. He's like, yeah, yeah. She drives off a little bit. He's kind of walking away now. I turn to this guy, he looks at me, we look at each other, nice, yeah. He walks away, I walk away, done. Was that not cool? And you know what that is? That's somebody, any of us, thinking, being prepared. And then working together, and diffusing the situation, and bringing hope to a crisis. Now that's an example of something in a parking lot. Let's look at an example of, you know, maybe you got a crisis situation, like um, what happened in Katrina. When Katrina hit, if anybody paid attention to the news, that got bad. Yes, okay, when that Superdome was filled with people, yes. and I got friends down in Lafayette area, um, and friends that have been to Bunky, Lafayette, Bill Platt, I've spoken a lot down in the Louisiana area, and they would tell me how, you know, the people that were coming from New Orleans up into different towns were migrating out, and a lot of them just never went back to New Orleans after Katrina hit. It was, it was just a really nasty situation. Rape took place in that Superdome. Beatings took place in that Superdome. Various areas were just used as bathrooms. Like, we're talking hallways were just used as bathrooms. It became what you would not imagine our country would ever allow to happen. But this is what can happen when desperation starts to set in. The people, though, that got into neighborhoods and came together and formed like little neighborhood communities, and I remember one story, I mean, they actually put perimeter wire up. They strung aluminum and tin cans on wire, and they ran it around like a couple different houses. This is one story, one, one of many, one story. And they ran the perimeter wire, so at night or someone's coming through, and they hit the wire, shake the cans, make the noise. And then they had these battery backup stations with, with like halogen lights on them up high. And if it was nighttime and that happened, there, was, there were always three or four people awake. And boom, the lights would go on, and they'd light up the area, and people would be on, on guard, ready to go. And they had to do this because things were getting so desperate. The people were being looted, TVs to water, and people were getting shot and beat. This was just happening. Even some cops crossed the line and did some things that were wrong. I mean, stories like this, it's just terrible stories that happen down there. One of the best parts of this one particular scenario is on the balcony, second floor of the house, outside balcony there, there was this grandmother sitting there with a shotgun on her lap. <laughs> And she said, in the, in the clip I saw, she said, oh, I had my dark <laughs> And I took it real. <laughs> she said, with a shotgun. She's ready to go. We can all do these things. But we have to take the steps in advance and build the community. One of the most important things is the community. And we'll focus on that first, the community part. Are you having conversations with loved ones, neighbors, family, friends now? Many people aren't. So a lot of people are thinking, yes, yeah, something can happen. But I'm not talking to anybody about it yet. Or this happens a lot. Man, Doug, I've been bringing it up and they think I'm crazy. Yeah. Okay? 
Anybody getting that? Raise your hand if you run into that. I read, half my family won't talk to me anymore. You know, for other reasons too, like my jokes. But that's a different thing. <coughs> funnier in my head. But, <laughs> anybody got a good Irish joke? I just love the Irish jokes. Right? Patrick, you got a good Irish joke. Right? <laughs> but when you talk to your family, your friends about this sort of thing, and you're trying to get neighborhood kind of community, how we approach it is important. And I'm going to throw out some ideas. You got to do what you got to do based on your situation. So these are not the only things that work, but these are ways that I find have worked. You can do a meeting, and I did this in Nebraska. Hey, I contacted five families that I thought would be on board and hopefully wouldn't think I was insane. And I just said, hey, I want to get a little meeting together about kind of some things that are happening in the world, the things that I see as a Catholic speaker around the country, people that I talk to, whether it's exorcist or people who are seeing, they get prophecies of things going on. Let's just kind of get together and talk about it. Well, yeah, okay, sure. It was just the, just the mom and dad, the husband and wife, right? So we get these five families together. And I just give a little talk on this, and I'm talking about some of the prophecies that are out there from the Blessed Mother, Church Approved Prophecies, to people who are having their own messages given to them they believe, and not verified maybe yet, but I say keep it arm's length, but pay attention if it doesn't contradict the faith. And so I was talking about some of this, I said, say, but the bottom line is, okay, so what would we do if this sort of thing happens? Would we have each other's back? By the end of the meeting, three of the couples came to me and said, this was awesome, Doug. Let's go to the next level. Let's have another meeting. Invite a few more people. I said, that's awesome. The other two were not the same. One of them just, hey, thanks. This was great. You see, that look on the face, kind of like, mm-hmm. The other one was the guy that walked up. Doug, this was really good. Really informative. I really appreciate you putting this on. He's a salesman, by the way. <laughs> Knows how to present that. <laughs> have a good day. Turns to walk away. His wife, right behind him, comes up, tears in her eyes, shakes my hand, and said, Thank you for this. Please pray for him. He does not want to do any of this. Okay, and therein lies a major part of the problem, too. Husbands and wives are not equally yoked when it comes to preparing. And a lot of dads, a lot of husbands are the problem. I hate to say it, guys, but come on. They are. They're like, yeah, we ain't going to worry about that. We'll be fine. Yeah, but what if somebody breaks in the house? Ah, I got a shotgun in the safe. Okay. Um, what if there's a fire? Ah, there's not going to be a fire in the house. We don't need to put smoke detectors on the roof, on the ceiling. I know guys that have told me this. Do you have smoke detector in your house? No. Why? I may get up a fire. How do you know that? There's an attitude, in, and I'm not just busting on us guys, but it's in a lot of guys. Most, the, the percentage of people that are, are BR Coalition members, the monthly online training members, like 65% are women. Which is funny because it's BR Coalition, it's BRAP, it's Get Ready, it's Self Defense, it's this sort of stuff. And the women are like, yeah! And then they'll send me messages, how do I get my husband on board with this? The community has to start with you and your spouse, above all. Okay, my wife's down in Texas, I'm here in Michigan. If something happens, we're already equally yoked with what we would do. Right? She knows the plan, she knows where to go. I have a word if I text it to her, call her, and say one word. It's a short word. No one knows it but her and my kids. That one word means I have absolute positive information that you know what's going to hit the fan. you got to be ready to move. Well, what direction do we move? That depends on where it hits from. And so therein lies another angle here. You do not know what it is going to look like or from which direction it will come. It could be a nuclear bomb, it could be an EMP, it could be a thug on the street, it could be civil unrest. When George Floyd died, did anybody honestly imagine it was going to blow up to what it did? Over 40 riots in Chicago alone. Antifa, BLM, a lot of them orchestrated together, choreographed together. No one has an idea. We don't. Did anybody have any idea when we heard about this weird virus coming out of, well, it's a bat thing? A, 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 was it a mop? What was it? I mean, was it some sort of, how did we get this? Oh, and then you had some politicians, everything's fine. The Democrats, I'm sorry, I'm not about some Democrats, but you're like the Schumers and the Pelosi. No, keep going to Chinatown. This, don't worry about it, this and that. And slowly, then very quickly, we're locked down, and we're six feet apart, and churches are shut down, and we're wearing masks, and now we're wearing two masks, right? While you're walking alone on a sidewalk in a park, you're wearing a mask. I'm not busting on people, but I don't understand it. And then we get to the point where the fear was so great that we stopped shaking hands, we started 
elbowing and fist bumping. If, if you're close enough to fist bump somebody, my spittle's hitting him in the face. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, just wipe that off there. <laughs> but he's breathing on me too. You know, it's the, this is insanity that we got to this point. Did anybody expect that that could have happened? No. I don't know. I didn't. Really shocked. So what's going to happen tomorrow? We don't know. On December 6, 1941, no one had an idea. Well, a few people might have because there was, there was talk that some people did have some idea what was going to happen. But those, most of those men, especially the over 1,000 men on the USS Arizona, had no real idea that, hey, tomorrow we're going to die. We're going to sink on this ship and get hit by a Japanese attack. No one had any idea. Okay. That's why the quote, the saying, I love this, I'd rather be 10 years early than one minute late. Right? If the power goes out right now, and you don't have backup battery power station, you don't have a flashlight, you don't have a, a power bank, you don't have any means of other power, you can just, how are we going to get power? Well, they'll turn it back on, won't they? Who's the they? Yeah. We are so reliant on they, whoever they is. I think they is a company up in Montana. I don't know. They incorporated. <laughs> it's they say, who's they? The power company, the guys are going to get the cherry picket trucks and go up and work on the lines, and the guys are going to go back to the, the nuclear plants and make sure we got the, uh, that everything's functioning the right way. And how are we going to, and we just count on they to fix these things. And the problem with that is they are human, they make mistakes, or some of they are corrupt. Yes. And so we have to be thinking about these things. Right now, this is our family in this room. And if everything hits the fan right this moment and we can't even drive out of here, we are all we have. And what we have on us and in this building and around on these grounds is all we have to work with. And so if we look at it that way, and I do this a lot, this isn't doom and gloom talk, this is reality check talk. This is the type of conversation I hope we have with our loved ones as we're trying to build community. So number one, you can have meetings and you can invite people in and say, hey, let's sit down and talk about things going on in the world. Let's talk about the threat of nuclear war. Whoa, that's a, that's a serious thing. Talk about things changing. 10, 15 years ago, that was not really high on the list of priorities with prepping, was there could be a nuclear war. It was there, but I didn't hear it a lot. And now you're seeing advertisements for gas masks and all kinds of filters for masks and iodine tablets and, and the little uh, Geiger counter cards and all this stuff, and it's out there. Why? Well, because of what's in the news. China, Taiwan, North Korea, Iran, all this talk. And the connections that are being made right now, China and Putin, I mean, when Xi Jinping and, and Putin got together, shook hands and said, friends for life, or whatever the thing was, it was like friends under all circumstances, whatever, it was just, it almost sounded like a high school bromance thing. You know, it was just kind of weird, but not healthy for the rest of the world when the two, most, two of the most powerful communist nations get together with the firepower that they have, the million man army plus that China has, and they don't show a lot of respect for human rights or life in general. You think they care about all those million men army? I will throw them out, we'll get them on the line. And then there is this attitude, you know, we, we just kind of think Putin is, uh, he's this loser kind of guy that's dying out. And then, for those of you, we've mentioned this in the past couple nights, I know, but when the leak came out of the Pentagon as to the Russia and Ukraine war, that Russia is actually winning this war. This was a leaked document from the Pentagon by the 21-year-old National Guard guy, how he got a hold of these documents. That's a whole other conversation to consider. For every one Russian killed, estimated seven Ukrainians are dying. And we're throwing billions of dollars at it. And by the way, also leaked was that we already have US troops on the ground in Ukraine. So this is not a proxy war anymore. It's just a matter of King Ferdinand getting shot. You know what I mean? Yeah. That one shot that starts World War I. All we need is something like that. One of those flybys by a Russian jet and the U.S. you know pilot does this or that, or the drone that got got taken down, got hit by the by the Russian jet. I mean, all it takes is this, that, or the other thing regarding this, that, or the other thing, and boom! All of a sudden, a cyber attack and our grid goes down. Now that's an extreme scenario, I know, but it is a possibility, and it's much more in the news now. Therefore, we need to look at our prepping and see where we need to change things to be considering some of that. I will say this though: you reach a point, I believe. You may disagree with that. It's entirely fine that you do. You may, I think you reach a point where you realize you cannot be ready for everything. You just can't. But you can be ready for a lot. And you can be ready for the little things. And you can be ready in such a way that if something big happens, your mindset, as we talked about last night, is a mindset that says, I figured out a way to survive this and get through it. And I figured out a way to reach out to other people. 
and they figured out a way, like the me and that guy standing in the parking lot of Menards. We figured out a way to work together and help the situation and diffuse it by simply coming together in that moment. Now, is that gonna stop World War III? No, but that's not my, that's not my security clearance. My security clearance is what God puts in front of me right here, right now. So getting community started is absolutely essential. So you're thinking to yourself right now, you know people who are kind of on board with you. Have you had lunch with them or coffee? Or, or brought them over for, for dinner? Have you decided to call you know, this family and that family and say, hey, you know what, we're kind of on the same page or something. Let's go over and talk, let's go over and talk about this. Right? Well, what are we going to talk about? Why well, don't we talk a little bit about you know, just kind of helping each other out in case we need to back each other up with food and water and some of this kind of stuff. You'd be surprised how many people are out there thinking the same thing, but no one's invited them, no one's brought it up, and so they're thinking they're the crazy one. And then you call them and say, and I know this because this is what I hear from people. And then I reached out, Doug, and I said, hey, hey, Marshall, do you want to come over? Yeah, I've been thinking the same thing. Oh, so you're both thinking the same thing, but no one wants to talk because you know what? We're afraid to look like the fool with the tinfoil hat. Get past that. And get past that yesterday. You've got to start making moves on things with people that you think, even pray about it. Everything got to be rooted in prayer. Everything we're talking about rooted in prayer. Please, Lord, help us with all this. Seal and protect all this in your precious blood. Let's make sure we are focusing on turning to God first. And then when God nudges your heart and says, hey, what's your name? Carol. Carol. And your name? Yeah. Donna. Do you know each other? We met this morning. Okay, yeah. But did you know that Donna might be a prepper? Did you know that? No. <laughs> okay. And did you know that she might be a prepper? And now they know. And so maybe she's thinking, no, nah, she looks like she might. Nah, I'm not going to reach out. She'll probably think I'm crazy. No, oh, reach out. We, we're running out of time, all right? And I don't want to sound apocalyptic here, but on the U.S. Grace Wars podcast that Father Holland and I do, we interview a lot of guests that are talking about even prophecies. And they're talking about a supernatural, I call it the supernatural gut feeling. And every time I present it to them, they go, oh, yeah, yeah. Jonathan Kahn's talking about this. We just, he just wrote the book, uh, Return of the Gods. He wrote The Harbinger. That's the current podcast that's out right now. A week before that, was it probably Chris Lar Or no, it was uh, Peter Herbeck. Um... Peter's a nice guy, kind of a lightweight, but he's a nice guy. Uh, <laughs> just kidding, he's a friend of mine, right? I know you know from the area. Uh, but Peter was on saying the same sort of thing, God speaking to his heart, and it's, things are different, things are serious. Peter heard, and this is on the podcast, so I'm repeating, it's not private. And Peter said that, um, I think I mentioned this a couple nights ago, that, um, that Christ spoke to him and basically said, I'm, in so many words, I'm getting up off my throne and I'm coming. And you will experience in the world rage, chaos, confusion, and apostasy. But it has to happen, because y'all got to know who I am. That's the Texas way of saying it. Y'all got to know who I am. I don't think Jesus talks that way. But. <laughs> Point I'm getting at is, a lot of people are feeling that. And I'm willing to bet a lot of you are too. There's something different now. And a lot of you are old enough to know, as Al Creston told me, he said this when I did the interview with him a couple days ago. And he just said, I've been around a long time, Doug. He was 72 this year, he said. And I've known Al for many years, and we don't know each other very, very, real closely, but uh, yeah, enough to get along real well. And he just said, Doug, i got to tell you, I've never seen it like this. The, the shifting is different now. I just don't know that we're all going to land on solid ground. You know, it just doesn't feel the same now. There's too many things that are up in the air, where the transgender stuff, the BLM stuff, the Antifa stuff, the threat of war, there's just too much. And you can't look to church leaders as well. I mean, you've got a solid priest here, but... But I don't know what your bishop's like, but you know there's a lot of bishops out there that are as complicit as can be when it comes to going along with certain things that are just off the rails wrong. We've got a lot of issues like this in the world. So where does that leave all of us? We're in a sandstorm. We can't look around and find an exact leader to really cling to and lead on. Lead on. We've got to turn to deeper prayer. We've got to turn to each other a little bit more and build that community. So you invite people over. Hey, let's have a meeting. Get together and talk about this. And then you have a couple of notes, and maybe you don't overwhelm. This is what some people do. They'll walk into a situation like that and go, okay, and then I have a couple things I want to share with you, and it's like four or three reminders. <laughs> Let's start here, all right? And, and it's so much for some people that it's, it's blown away. It's kind of like the guy that's a marathon runner who says to the person who almost never runs, hey, let's go on a workout today. Let's go for a run. Well, how far are we going? We're just going an easy five miles. And the guy that never runs is like, I'm going to be dead after one. No, no, we're going to push through five. We do that as preppers sometimes. You come in, and I want to share everything with you right off the bat. And that is really hard to do for the average person. It's hard for them to take. So when you get together with people and you discuss, start slow. Work in a little bit. 
Now, I've been developing a couple of friendships, a few friendships down in Texas since I got there it'd be four years this summer. And I had to find out who was on board. A couple of guys came up to me, hey, Doug, I'm familiar with you from the, you know, EBT or whatever. I said, well, that's great. Okay, there's a door open. Hey, you want to get together and have lunch sometime? Yeah, I'd love to hunt. We hang out, we have lunch, we're talking. And uh, he's like, so, hey, man, um, what do you think about the world of the church? There's an opening door right there. Okay, you know what? Yeah, I just, you kind of feel it out a little bit. You know how this works. And you start bringing up things. Yeah, I'm a little concerned about, like, water shortages and things like that. Yeah, are you really? Yeah, how come? Well, you know, if a power outage happens, and they had that power outage in North Carolina, not long ago, 40,000 people were affected for several days. You know, when power outages go out, you know what else gets shut down a lot of times? Water treatment plants. Yes. And then my friend says to me, what? Oh, yeah. Do you know how much water a person should have every day? Uh, about a gallon, give or take, you know. Really? <coughs> yeah, I got some sort of water in my house. You do? Yeah, yeah. And sometimes that's as far as I would go with the conversation. And he's going to go home and talk to his wife about it. You know it. And he did. <laughs> and his wife lit up. She's like, finally, God's answering my prayers. <laughs> I know that happened because we've been friends for several years. We have lunch regularly now. And he's one of my go-to guys, and, and I'm one of his. And he told me, yeah, I went home and told her about what she said. And she's like, oh, I've been praying for you to meet somebody who would actually light you up and get you on fire for this stuff. And she runs out and buys him an AR-15 for his birthday. It's <laughs> <laughs> so like over his house later, and he says, Doug, let me show you what my wife got me. <laughs> yeah, it has a lot to do with you. Because <laughs> like, really? he's not into that stuff hardly at all. But she is, and so it helped them. All right, but it all started with him and I getting together and having lunch. And just put, throwing out a couple of questions, get the conversation started. So you got to kind of feel it out with the people you're with. But I really got to say, I really believe you got to start doing it. Now, events like this are great because now you've seen faces and you meet people and you know names. And if in any way you want to create some sort of, and I know some do this, like Father Mark back in, uh, in Tyler, Texas. He, um, he put a list out on the table and he said, here, sign it. I want you all to sign this. Anybody wants to be part of church security team, sign this. We're we'll get some training going. We got some law enforcement guys here. Because I'm the guy that comes in and tries to fire it up a little bit. And then I say, you got to find your resources locally. And you got to start working because you have resources in this room that can do a lot to take this way down the field. All right? So Father Mark would say, here's a clipboard. Put your name on it. And anybody who wants to meet again and talk about prepping stuff, I'm going to be giving a talk on it. Uh, Father Mark is actually one of our BRC members. So he follows a lot of stuff we put out. And he's been, he, Doug, come over to the rector. I want to show you what I bought now. You know, it's, I got a big power, power station. I got the water. And I got the filters and so forth. And you think I need anything else? It's like, well, what's good? He's doing great, though. But it's a process. But he initiated it by saying, here, let's do it now because we're in the room together. So take advantage of this day. And, you know, take a break in here somewhere and just talk with each other and share names, phone numbers. Follow-up meetings, things of that nature. Share what you know is going on in the region. All right? Build that community with your family members. And, and we'll, we'll take questions on each of these topics. I don't want to get questions on the community thing in just a minute. I'll say really one more thing, key thing on here. You're inviting your friends. You're having lunch with people. You're bringing them over for dinner. Or you're going to go all out and just say, we're having a meeting on something. Come on over. If you think you got people who are on board, you can do any and all of that sort of thing. Family. Sometimes close family is the hardest one. Yeah, because they're the ones that just go, I don't want to hear it anymore. Yeah. Right? I was talking to somebody recently, and he was unloading on me about mobs and gangs and stuff and, and law enforcement things because he and his family are kind of tied to this kind of stuff. This went on for a long time. And I was loving it because I'm into that stuff. When I say into it, I do this stuff for a living, so I pay attention to stuff so I can take it. There's a callousness a thick skin that you develop when you look at this, and when you bring prayer into it, and I cannot emphasize that enough, God's grace has to be our stabilizing factor. If I'm not on my knees in prayer, I pray a daily rosary, I fast at least five, six days a week, even a little bit, and I'm not, it's not a pat, I'm not a pat on the back, I'm trying to encourage you. If we don't do those spiritual things, the spiritual bones and muscles aren't going to be in us like they need to be. And when things start getting really nasty and people start loading heavy stuff on you, you're not going to cave as readily. You're going to go, okay, I see this. Let's look at the perspective of our Lord, the Blessed Mother. Let's get the grace of God flowing here. So this guy's unloading on me and talking. At one point he stops and he goes, this feels so good. I can't vent to anybody about this stuff, Doug. Oh, my family tells me we're done. Stop talking. He says, but it's inside. I'm concerned about this. And he wasn't anxious. 
He was just sharing. All right? So family, and he was talking about his family mainly, who just says, shut it down. We don't want to hear it. And you might be running into that. Anybody running into that sort of thing? Oh, yeah. yeah, it's hard. So my advice to you with regards to family is <coughs> speak your peace peacefully and then leave it alone and let them see what you're doing. Okay, I've had family members come to me later, like months, year, oh, one of those like four or five years, something happened and all of a sudden I got a text. Hey, I know you, you know about this certain thing. What do you think we should do with this? How about this? And it come out of nowhere. Old priest friend that I knew years ago would say, don't be afraid to be a stick in the mud because when the mud slide happens, people will be reaching for that stick. <laughs> right? They'll be sliding down with that mud and say, grab something you can hold on to. And that's you because you've been out there the whole time. Isolated, feeling alone, feeling kind of creepy sometimes when people think you're nuts. You know, you've got all the information in the world and they don't want to listen to it. It's like the evangelization thing. Jesus loves you. Yeah, thanks, man. I went to Mass. I'm good. You know? And you want to share it because you care. And they don't want to hear it, and you gotta let you gotta respect that to a point, I think. And so I just back off on it. And what I do say is this though: Has anybody heard this? Oh, really, man? You got it all. You got you're prepared. If anything happens, I'm coming to your house. <laughs> and my answer has now been, it used to be, oh, really? Okay, well, um, I guess that's the Christian thing. I am not that way anymore at all. No. I'm far more simple now. I'm much more. When they say that, I go, no, you're not. Unless you got a truckload or a carload of stuff and you've been getting ready. Don't think you're coming to my place and, and, and leeching off of the stuff I've been doing if you're doing nothing about it. Look, are you serious? <laughs> yeah. I just smile and say, yeah. You know what that makes them do? It makes them think. It makes them go, oh, really? But, Doug, you're that Catholic evangelist guy, right? <laughs> not the kind you think I am. <laughs> And I don't mean that to sound mean, but even St. Paul says if you don't work, you don't eat. I mean, there's something about not getting free handouts indefinitely. The idea of a welfare program is to help somebody up so they can get on their feet and move. Not, hey, I'm going to do nothing because you're doing it. And I'm just going to come to your house when it happens. And I, just, I, I nicely, with a smile, will say, eh, it's not going to happen. Really? No, no. You would love to show up? No, hey, man, I love you like a brother, but don't be coming with you, your wife, and all your kids expecting to eat all my food. If you're not bringing anything to the table, right? Because I'm trying to motivate them. I'm not trying to be mean. Okay, so on that point, let me make this real quick. At my camp, we'll call it my camp. Get your camp. It's your home. It's your primary shelter. It's your number one place. It's where most of your gear is, right? That's your home, predominantly, right? That's where we keep most of our stuff. How we have things stored up and everything and what we do with it, um, sometimes it's big five gallon containers. So I got the 55 gallon drums, you know, and I have water and I've got this. Okay, and that's great. But if someone comes to your door and knocks on the door, we're starving, we're hungry, we have no water, we're, we're filthy, and the hygiene problems, I mean, which is going to kill a lot of people, by the way. The hygiene problem, if, if the hygiene gets shut down, like no running water, no hospital urgent care as readily available, you're going to have all kinds of massive problems. Cuts and scrapes that can't get cleaned out can become infected. It can lead to all kinds of health issues, okay? So if someone comes to your door, what are you going to do? No, I'm sorry. I'm a Christian, but I'm not helping you. And it's going to really, it's going to be hard to turn people away, right? And so you got to figure out a way. And here's my way. I have water stored in 55-gallon drums, and I have 6- and 7-gallon drums, all BPA-free plastic, uh, to the best of my ability, right? Because you don't want the plastic leaching into the water. All right, store it in a moderate place. Try not to put it in sunlight. Light through clear bottles and such will affect growth of things. I mean, these little things in details, right? And then I also have like gallon size jugs, and then I have individual water bottles. And, and it's BPA free plastic, by the way, right from the grocery store down there, I can get them. And I also then have, you know, bags of food, containers of food, five gallon buckets of food, boxes of food and cans of food, freeze dried food and all this. But I also have protein bars and granola bars and bags of beef jerky. And then I also have, you know, containers of cleaning stuff and hygiene, this, 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 and the other thing. And then I also have uh, packages of 100 baby wipes. And I buy them in boxes. You get like 800 in a box. So you get eight packages of them, right? Probably because I have grandkids, okay? The other reason is, and I've got thousands of these, okay? Like 10,000 or whatever it is now. If someone knocks on my door, and they, they will dry out over time, so you can put those, you can either re, re uh, uh, moisten them with a little bit of water or put them in a Ziploc bag, which helps uh, provide another layer to keep them drying out so much. But I've tested them, I've opened up the box like three years later, and they're still very moist, so everything's fine if you get good brands. If someone comes to my door, we need help, I got kids, we need food, I can give them a few of these bottles of water, 
I give them a, a package of baby wipes so they can keep clean for a little while, and I give a bag of beef jerky and some granola bars and say, I, can't, I don't have enough to lunch in here, I can give you this and give you hope, and then try to point you a direction where maybe you can get more. Now this is gonna be a tough call. I mean, don't, don't take this lightly. It's not gonna be easy for us to turn anybody away. It's gonna be hard to vet people. But there will be people who will try to get through your wire, we'll use terms like this, into your camp. You've got your family, your friends, your community that you've developed and you're working on, and someone wants to come in, you can't just let anybody in without knowing what their intentions are. Honestly, my wife, kids, grandkids, my friends, my family, those are the ones that I'm responsible for most. You know, if I don't know who this guy is, he could look, hey, like the nicest guy in the world. I don't know if he's Ted Bundy. I mean, I mean just to draw an extreme, you know, um, connection there. But you don't know if the guy's like, hey, man, we just really need some help. Yeah. And once I get in and you're asleep, I'm going to slit your throat. I mean, you hate to say that. You really do. Write this down again if you haven't watched it or listened to it. One year in hell or a year in hell. I mentioned it a couple days ago. you got to listen. It's 17 and a half minutes, all it is. It's on YouTube. A year in hell or one year in hell. Either way, you're searching the one. It'll come up. He recounts what it was like in Bosnia. And what he says is good men became just desperate men. And desperate men do desperate things. And they do it sometimes because they're trying to help their family. We've talked about this before, but I can't emphasize that enough. We all are fine because we have lights, power, water, food, and bathroom facilities that work. Right? When your water treatment plants get shut down and your bathroom facilities don't work, what's your backup for a bathroom? Hygiene, bathroom, these things, keeping clean. This is all very, very serious stuff. And people can get very tribal and animalistic fast when they don't have the basic necessities, which is why I emphasize, like in your go bag, we'll break down individual things more in just a little bit. I emphasize that you have things like toothpaste, a travel toothbrush even, something like that, deodorant, mouthwash, whatever, things like this that make you feel human. Why do you think, especially in war, like in World War II, you see old videos like Saving Private Ryan type movies and such, and you guys got on the battlefield, right? And they're shaven, right? Some of these guys were. Not all, but some were, right? Because they needed to keep a certain respect of the dignity of the human person. And dignity can go down very quickly. Look what's happening at the border. You realize anybody watching the news right now about the border? Title 42 is about to get shut down. Have you seen the video of the lines of immigrants that are at the border right now getting ready to cross. Yeah, it is, I'm, I'm from Texas now, and the stories we hear down there, it's just, it is unreal, unreal where we are. And when you see what these people are, how they're living as they've been traveling to get here, and what they leave behind when they cross people's land, like Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, that area, people's land, the videos we see down there in the film, you can all find it too if you look for it, um, is un unbelievable they will leave on people's land. What people will do can get very dark very fast. We need to head those things off. Community is one of the key ways of doing it. So again, you have the meetings, you meet with people individually, have coffee, build relationships, build friendships, start having those conversations about what they might be doing, what you might be doing, what you bring to the table, and so forth in a certain situation, circumstance. And when it comes to family, introduce the idea to them, do it peacefully. Of course, we all hear this. My kids just think that I harp and nag on them and so forth. All right, back off and just tell them, remind them. I've told my kids this. You heard this. I raised you this way. I'm not going to hammer you with this stuff anymore. You're all adults. But I will tell you this. If anything gets, if anything gets really serious, I am going to let you know, and I don't want to get any weird look from you. Okay? And they're all really good about that, my kids, anyway. But I kind of head that off in advance and say, don't roll your eyes at me if I tell you that I'm seeing something like a cyber attack that shuts down 12 airports simultaneously as a test, to test and see what would happen. So I tell them that stuff, and they go, oh, really, that happened? Yeah, yeah. And they get in their head, and then I just remind them, have a plan. Have a plan. Have an idea what you're gonna do. You got stuff you got to go back in your car still? Yeah, well, not always. Okay, I'm gonna keep it in your car, right? If it's in your car, your car in your home, that means you have access to it, because your car's at home when you're at home, right? Um, so take it in the house, leave it in the house, they get the car and leave, doesn't help you because it's not accessible now. If my flashlight is in my rental car out there and I don't have access to it, I can't use it. Very simple concept. So just kind of remind your kids of those things and then we got to respect it and back off a little bit. Any questions on community or want to say anything about that before we move on in the next subject? Anything at all? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. I've listened to you for a while and um, you probably going to go back and forth about whether we want to move out into the country or if it's safer to stay in our little subdivision. 
subdivision that's got you know like 50, 50 houses because he thinks it's easier to fight something off if you have a neighborhood with only one entrance and you can make friends to for defense as opposed to being in the country on your own if a gang or somebody comes in it's going to you know you're dead right hmm. pros and cons of something like that it depends on how far you are in the country how isolated you are and hidden um, in a neighborhood Neighborhoods get hit faster normally in civil unrest because you know gangs aren't going to go looking for the individual person way out in the rural. That's fast. Could it come to that? Eventually, it could. Um, yeah, neighborhoods in general, you've got more manpower. So I would say depending on the size of the neighborhood, depending on the location of the neighborhood in relation to where you would move to, um, it, it, it's a toss up depending upon. I mean, there's certain things like inner city stuff. If you live in the inner city or in a city in general and everything really hits the fan, have a plan to get out. You might need to get out and get out fast. All right. There are a lot of experts out there, like even Dr. Peter Pry, who's been talking about the power grid for years. And they have come out and said very clearly, if the grid goes down, inner cities are going to become nothing but chaos and hell. Oh, yeah. They already are. <laughs> they already are in some ways, absolutely. Yeah, well, especially places that have been defunded and so forth, that's a good example. And that's when there's reasonable civilization going on with running water and electricity. Take those couple factors away. Take any of the serious infrastructure away, like water and electricity. People, people will panic incredibly fast. <laughs> Rural compared to neighborhoods, I would say depends on the neighborhood. I'm in a neighborhood and it's about 30 homes, but it's about 15, 20 minutes outside of Tyler. So I like where I am. I've got field and country around me. I've got good neighbors around me for the most part. Um, I like my location. I know people that are rural and on their own. and. I would opt for neighborhood if the neighborhood is reasonably safe and you've got good people there. Um, those factors have to be there for me though. Like if none of my neighbors are doing anything to get ready, I don't feel the safe around them then. But I've got, good, I've got decent neighbors around me. I don't know them all, but I've got decent ones around me. Um, but again, depending on where you would go, because there is the risk if you're way out in a rural area alone, you're more isolated, less likely for gangs to get out to something like that, but that doesn't mean the odd person might not come by and find it, and then it could, you know, things could go bad from there. Uh, and defensive, excuse me, precip um, precipitation. <laughs> defensive measures and how, you, how people participate in defensive measures is something to consider. Not everybody's on board with the idea of defense. You know, a lot of people are, are they're, they're just like, Again, we talked about this last night, self-defense and such. You hate thinking about this. For example, you know how many people I've talked with who've said, oh, I, I, I just, I got a knife. I got, I'm gonna use a knife if I have a problem. I said, have you, ever, have you ever visualized, especially when women will say this, visualize putting a knife into another body and then I mean, shoving that knife in? Because you're not just gonna go, you're gonna have to, right? And me doing that, I can see faces sometimes that go, most of us don't understand the concept of even punching somebody hard, let alone shooting or stabbing. And it, it, a year and a half, he talks about that kind of stuff. How you know they had to have at least four or five people awake at all times with and armed. Because they had 20, 30 gangs of 20, 30, 40 people, give or take, that would roam the streets and do what they want, take what they want, how they want. And so the idea of being alone concerns me a little bit, but it depends on where your situation is and how well armed you are. Like my wife and I are alone in our house. If there's a serious situation, one of us has to be awake all the time, but you can't watch all four sides of the house. There's just no way. So I don't want that. And that's why I told my family, I got a son and his wife close, close by, my son-in-law and his wife, my daughter close by, friends. I said, we've got to get together fast. If something really gets out of hand, really gets out of hand, we've got to get together fast. So you got to kind of weigh the two. Um, there's pros and cons to both of them, though. So, any other questions about the community part? Yeah, yes. I have a comment. Sure. You talked about turning people away. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of the ten virgins preparing for the bridegroom. Right. Five or, ten virgins preparing for the bridegroom. Five were ready with their oil lamps, and five weren't. And the five got in, and they turned the others away because they weren't prepared. Right. 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 That's an excellent point, and we talk about that. People ask, well, where's the scripture behind what you're saying, Doug? And that's one of the passages we bring up, is our Lord even makes it clear that being prepared is a good move, and you could, and so say, well, that's just purely a spiritual component there. <coughs> well, okay, if you want to look at it that way, we go back to the Old Testament of Joseph and Pharaoh. I mean, you talk about preparedness, if God doesn't make the point there, Pharaoh has the dream. 
It's a dream of seven fat cows, seven skinny cows, seven grain, healthy grain, seven unhealthy grain. In the dream, the skinny cows, the sickly cows eat the fat cows, they don't get healthy. And the bad grain eats the healthy grain, it doesn't change its stature, right? And so he comes out of this dream, what does this mean? I need somebody to help me. And his, you know, voodoo wizardy kind of guys couldn't figure it out. And somebody comes up and says, hey, there's this guy in prison. And he's there because of a trumped up um, false sexual harassment charge, by the way, just so you know. Anyway, and, uh, and he knows dreams. <laughs> we don't know how, but okay, bring him to me. Joseph comes out, he hears the dream. Talk about the pressure moment for Joseph. This is Pharaoh. And he's got to interpret the dream and tell him what it means. He could have simply said, that means you're supposed to let me go. <laughs> Give me a chariot and a bunch of water and food, I'm going home. But he didn't. He told him what it meant. You're going to have seven years of bounty and seven years of famine. It's going to be devastating famine. Seven years. All of Egypt. This is going to crush people. People are going to die. It's going to be horrendous. Many will not survive. I added some of that to the scripture. Okay, so. <laughs> and Pharaoh says, in so many words, you know Pharaoh had to ask him common sense. Well, what should we do? And you know Joseph probably said right back, I don't know, be a prepper. <laughs> right? What do you mean? We've got to get ready. So for seven years, and Joseph was put in charge, second to Pharaoh, and given a, a Pharaoh's daughter to marry and all, and he went all over Egypt, and he prepared. They took a measure of wheat from all the harvest, and you know what? They, had, they took so much that Scripture makes some, some reference to, they couldn't count anymore. They had so much stored up. You know what else they would have had to create and build, though, right? The infrastructure to store it. And everything that goes with what you do with wheat and grain and so forth. It wasn't just, just wheat. No, it's everything that has to fit into that puzzle. They have, would have had done that for seven years. It takes time to train. One of my favorite quotes. It takes time to train. It takes time to prepare. And so it's not a matter of going to Costco today after this talk and buying a pallet full of ketchup and pickles. And then, just for fun, you're going to see a pallet of pickles and ketchup and you're going to laugh now. Okay, you think of me, right? All right. But it's not about just buying a pallet and buy, ordering a, a backup battery station with solar panels, get yourself some extra ammo and put it all in a room and say, now I feel good. Right? You got to use it. You got to train. You got to get ready. You got to talk to people, process it, and pray, 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 pray through and around it all. But I'll, I'll finish this about Pharaoh. Joseph does this. And it states in scripture that all of Egypt and all the one translation says all the world, but at least all the surrounding provinces of Egypt and Egypt were spared and a remnant was preserved because of what God did through that, that experience. So if anybody doubts that God wants us to naturally look at circumstances, red flags, and take proper action, mm -hmm. we're not paying attention to that scripture or the passage you mentioned there about, about the bridesmaids and the oil. The, the virgins no one. So, uh, yes, ma'am. <coughs> we owned a um, bar restaurant at the time of that big power outage several years ago, back in 2001, I think it was. I was absolutely appalled at how many people we had lines outside because we had cash. And we always had cash on hand in the safe. But they said, we can't even go to a place where they do still have gas because we have absolutely no cash. Mm. We only deal with credit cards. Yeah. We couldn't use credit cards. Even a dollar, they didn't have any cash whatsoever. That I will recommend, since you brought it up, the topic on cash, if you don't have cash out already on hand, for the time that it's still able to use, yeah. Yeah. because there's talk of FedCoin, yeah. Central Bank, digital dollar, and all that is definitely in the works. There are commercials for things like FedNow and other groups that are already putting in place a digital dollar idea. Now, the Fed, the Treasury has made this clear. Oh, no, we're not going to do central bank stuff. We're just going to do all this other stuff. They're laying down the structure for it. And financial experts that are in that world, when you listen to them, they're all, they all have their varying degrees. Like Dave Ramsey, if you're following him. I'm not a big follower of any of them. I do a little bit with, with a number of them. Ramsey does not believe in gold and silver. Yeah, he said this on video. He says, no, no, it's all, it's, it's basically real estate, property, and, uh, you know, stocks, bonds, things like that. He's into stock market stuff. Uh, then you got guys like Glenn Beck, and you got guys like Kiyosaki, you know, these guys, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Kiyosaki. These guys, um, they do a little bit of everything, gold, silver, this, that. Kiyosaki says, I believe in all the precious metals, gold, silver, lead, copper. <laughs> he's, a world, he's a Vietnam vet, and he says, I have pallets. He says, I have pallets of 223. 
for AR-15 and 5.56. He's got pallets of it. All right, because he says it's going to be barterable in the future. It's going to be a form of economy. There's a lot of talk of parallel economies going on right now. You know, this is one of the reasons that, that Biden wants to have a, a, a crypto czar, because Bitcoin is a threat to what they want to do. You know, and I'm not a big, I don't understand Bitcoin extensively, and I don't have any. But I do, my son in laws into it a bit, and I do know that it's that type of thing that the government wants to get a hold of entirely. Um, so we do have to be aware of it. But having cash now, I think, is important. And smaller bills are important. Like, I, whenever I travel, I mean, I'm carrying like $7,000 in my wallet right now. I shouldn't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Would you protect me? You're <laughs> But no, seriously, I keep a few extra hundred dollars on me when I go on a trip like this because I don't know if I'm going to need it. And it's in a tucked away in the wallet, and it's not, it's not average money. It's not the money that I spend on going to the grocery store. It is, it is purely for, uh, it's emergency money. That's what it is. But if you can keep out five, ten thousand, if you got it, like I'm not the type of guy that has a lot of cash on hand, even you know in the bank or out of the bank. But if I keep a couple thousand at home in a safe or something, I do that um, because it's good to have that. If something gets shut down in that situation you talked about, ma'am, and have you noticed this that there are places and banks and grocery stores? I think you mentioned this. Was it you, Roy, about um, the store like for a month they had uh, no cash available? Yeah. Have you, anybody seen that sort of thing happen? Yeah. It's happening all over the country. I, I personally believe it's testing. It's all testing. They, they kind of poke the perimeter constantly to see what our reaction is and also to get us used to it. It's kind of like when there's cameras everywhere now. You walk down Walmart and there's a camera right there. He's just recording in progress. Ah, really? Or you, you, know, you do self-checkout. Camera right there. It's like, oh, is that my tooth? You know? I mean, it, it's everywhere. And it, what it does is it gets us used to seeing ourselves on camera and being recorded everywhere, you know, like China. Yeah, yeah. They record everything. And facial recognition is also a big deal. Okay, here's another thing. Since we're on this topic, I'll throw this in, but bring it back to the prepping stuff. Is um, If you're in Amazon One, Amazon One is palm scan payment. It's like facial recognition for your palm. This came out over about a year ago. And there are videos online. Look for Amazon One palm payment or something to that effect and you'll find it. And you'll see videos. Uh, Austin, Texas, there was a video. Oh, they have a new thing going on today. It's a news program. And Whole Foods is doing it. And Austin, Austin is crazy, by the way. For us, those of us in Texas, we wouldn't care if Austin would just go to, like, Oregon. <laughs> Handful of people in Austin probably good. Anyway, uh, and what you do is you've got something that's about the diameter of the bottle, the bottom of this bottle, and it's right there. And you put your hand over it, about four inches from it, and it scans your hand prints, the palm print. It gets effective like facial recognition. And but you've entered your debit card or your credit card, you punch in all your information, so now it's linked. So in the future, you can just go by and go, beep, and walk right out. The Amazon stores are doing too. Okay, yeah, and it's good. This sort of stuff is going to grow, and it's happening very quickly. Um, it's uh, there are some stores like Macy's. Uh, there's an article Macy's and other stores that are using facial recognition uh, in order for you to buy something. They have to. They're doing facial recognition, and they say it's because of, of shoplifting. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so Amazon stores do that. You got one in Dearborn, an Amazon store, where she says you walk in the door, you have, they'll scan your card when you walk in, so anything you touch, um, it'll, it'll, they can link it to it. Yes? I punch in out of work for your friends. I'm oh, oh, sorry? I punch in and out of work with a fingerprint. With a fingerprint now? Okay, fingerprint, yeah. Yeah, the TSA, by the way, is going to biometrics. Um, in the future, they say it's going to be obligatory that you cannot fly unless you do something like the clear eye scan that they have at airports now. Like, I'm not signed up for clear. You know, um, it's, you know, just put your thing in the thing, they check your eyes, they know who you are because they've already done background checks on you with the feds and all this. And then you can just walk through and it's it's quick entrance. You know, I get the cattle line. I go to the cattle line, right? And watch the, uh, you know, the those people buzz right by. <laughs> I can look in my eyes and I get on the plane. <laughs> yeah, and they can track you everywhere too. Um, but the head of TSA came out and he said, this will become federal rule across the country. You will not be able to travel eventually. You won't be able to fly without biometrics um, security. Yeah. So facial recognition, retina scan recognition, all this stuff. And then they let everybody in. Right. Yeah, and the border security, by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and Jeff Epstein did, anyway. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, you know, there's a lot of speculation on that. My personal opinion on it is I wouldn't I would not be shocked if this before the end of the year we see some major, major transformation, mainly because they're already establishing with commercials on TV, they're already pushing for, you know, um, hundred percent changeover from your dollar to our digital dollar. These things are already on I mean I saw it on a commercial a couple nights ago on, on I was watching uh, when I got down here in the hotel. Uh, I was watching the news and there was a commercial that came on about a digital dollar company. Fed now has already announced that they're coming out. That's been in the news in July, and many of the so-called experts who are on the side of more conservative Christian thinking, they'll tell you this is all infrastructure being laid down. How fast it actually transfers over has a lot to do with our response and reaction, which is why these constant testing things like no cash here at this store for a while and this and that, because then we start saying, well, how do we solve the problem? Well, we it, it's better than just to have a card with a digital. No, how about we just do? This is how about you just scan me? It, they're gonna keep pushing for convenience. The AI is another issue too. So let me bring that up real quick before we get to like bug out bags and water. And all. AI is an issue that we've heard that Elon Musk has even come out. If you're not familiar with this. And he sent a letter along with close to a thousand other experts in AI and electronics saying that there needs to be, he said, needs to be a six month minimum moratorium on any more AI advancement mm -hmm. because it's far too dangerous. He says it could become civilizationary destruction, he said, yeah. destroying our civilization, yeah. right? He said this about Tucker Carlson before Tucker was, you know, yeah. dealt with, mm -hmm. and, in, and in other places. Now, another guy came out last time, I think it's Dadowski, something of this nature, 20-plus uh, year expert in AI and security research and technology and all, and he said, Musk is wrong on that. It should be a permanent <laughs> moratorium. Yeah. He said it doesn't go far enough. He said this is so far beyond what people understand dangerous, and it's already happening. If you've got <laughs> Siri and Alexa or whatever on your phone and you're using it, that's a, that's a form of AI. Okay, it's this kind of, it's like predictive text is a type of, it's all like, incremental, but we're to a point now, and you've probably heard the stories where AI is passing the bar for, for uh, and, and, and a lawyer, I mean, Rory, you're a lawyer, right? I don't practice anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Does it sound crazy that AI could pass the bar though? Uh, oh, sure. Yeah, and that's, that's a, supposed to be a pretty good test for you guys, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like I, have nothing, I have no clue my law <laughs> or what it takes to become a lawyer. Um, AI is writing term papers for people. I know a guy who they wanted him and his wife wanted to test it in homeschooling. And if anybody does homeschooling, if you're familiar with Seton, Seton is a tough way. They a lot of writing. We did a seat for our kids. They like a lot of writing done. And this one kid, fifth, sixth grade, seventh grade maybe, uh, was struggling with a particular report. So the parents said, "Let's see what AI would do, just to see." And AI nailed it. And they changed just a couple words and submitted it to see if it would go through. No problems. So I'm really encouraged that the doctor I may have one day got his uh, medical license with passing his classes with AI. You know? But this is where we are with this. And it could be the, the point of, of basically AI simply is being designed to survive and grow and become a behemoth. And a lot of the people behind it and Musk actually got into a debate with the guy who runs, I think it's Google, and, and Musk in the interview with Tucker Carlson, Musk was accused by this guy of being what he called a specious. In other words, he favors the human species. <laughs> this other guy criticized him for being that way, for not being all in on technology just soaring. So we are living in a very, very quickly changing world. And none of us really can escape the AI stuff because it's being in implemented in every other area. Banks are using it. Insurance companies are using it. It's, it's being brought in because it can be very effective in certain ways. I, mean, I like the idea of some AI, the fact that they say I, AI will be able to di help diagnose sicknesses and viruses if, when just breathing into an AI type machine or be able to determine this sort of thing. I mean, that's kind of cool to think if you could help save lives. Any technology that can help improve a person's life in a way that doesn't contradict the church's teachings on dignity and respect and life and so forth isn't a bad thing, right? But it's when it ends up in the hands of the wrong people, okay? Yes? I was gonna say, I think most people know Google, du most people know Google duplicates the web on its internal servers. That's why it can search so fast. But AI can go through the, most of the internet. It doesn't need the Google ser servers. 
So imagine something that can quickly process, go across the whole internet. I know there's a Christian consultant that says there's a lot of plagiarism going on, and yeah. AI will, or ChatGPT will try to find something that it thinks will you know, follow the, the keyword search and stuff. So it's not true AI yet, because true AI is not stoppable. Mm. True AI means this, this learning software goes way beyond its original programming constraints. I, that's why I think Musk wants to put constraints on it. Because you don't want true AI. Because I watched all the sci-fi movies with AI and you know AI taking over the world and all that stuff. This is the kind of stuff that's possible if it's not controlled. And you got countries like China, Japan, uh, China, Russia that don't want to put constraints on it, but they still want to yeah. try to control it. Yeah. I, uh, sir, you bet. I'm, uh, I'm wondering if you're AI. You're pretty smart. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an IT guy. Security. You're an IT guy. Okay. He's an IT security guy. Uh, and on top of the AI stuff is the deep fake stuff. You combine the deep fake with the AI, then you get even more problems where they're actually they're thinking that they're going to be able to start putting. Uh, we could put Rory in yeah. a strip club. Okay. And I hate to put it that way. So, you know, Rory's like, why? Why did you? Okay, we're smoking some wacky tobacco or something. I don't know. But what I'm saying is you can do a deep fake now. And with the, the ability of this, and all of a sudden you see a video out there of me, you know, walking out of some other you know, woman's house or something, or, or hanging out with the mafia in Chicago. Or, you know, I mean, all of a sudden we see father and, you know, no, I'm not going to do it. No, but I'm serious. You see what I'm saying, though? They can twist and pervert with this stuff. It, it, that's what you're saying, too, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's, so we're in a different world. Yeah. And so I guess if, let's bring this point in. What will God allow? So when God is speaking to a lot of hearts, and I'm willing to bet, and I'd like to ask, is there anybody here that you feel in your gut, in your heart, God is speaking to you in a way that's kind of nudging you to, to be, be better prepared because you sense something on a, on a grander scale that's about to happen in some way? Is there anybody who feels that way? Because I feel that way every day. Yeah. And it's not anxious. It's not anxious. It's urgent. And there's a difference. I'm going to emphasize that again. Urgent is something serious. We've got to address it. Anxious is, oh, no, I don't know what to do. And so we're not anxious. We're urgent. We're looking at the urgency. Yes? Yeah, yeah, and, and I'm glad you brought that up. Let's get back to the point on the prepping stuff because when it comes to prepping, you, you know, you can bring the AI and and the, the deep fake stuff and the worry of Bitcoin and Fed dollar and oh my goodness and the injections that have caused problems for people and now they're talking about this Marbug Marbug virus I think, which Father Jim Blunt mentioned when we interviewed him um, for the podcast that comes out Wednesday and then two days later he sends me a link saying, "Do you see this? This is what we just talked about." CDC comes out and is warning us against the Marburg virus. I think it's Marburg, right? Because it's broken out in a couple of different countries. I mentioned this a couple nights ago. And they don't know how to deal with this, okay? And the mortality rate is, is averaging at 50%. All right? So if this sort of stuff happens again, we're, we feel like we're at a, at a complete loss for all of this. And I say, it's kind of like the idea, I can't prep for all of this. So I'm going to do what I can with what I have, with the time that I have, and the resources that I have, and then I'm leaving the rest of God. And so people will tell me, how much water do I have? How much water should we store up? My answer is, I don't know. <laughs> how many guns should I have? I don't know. How much ammunition is too much ammunition? And my answer to that is, um, I, don't think, I don't think it's ever too much. I just, I just, I just <laughs> <laughs> Texas, we're talking. Yes, back here. Yes. I'm glad you brought that up. If we do events like this that are designed to move us into some sort of action, spiritual and natural, but we don't engage in that action, then I, I, I just I don't think these events are as successful as they could be. And you know, I mean, everybody again could go home and get your flashlight and your Costco pallets of you know ketchup and pickles and all that. Right. You can do those things, and that's great. But the community part, 
Without that, we really miss out on one of the most important pieces of all of this. We need each other. You know what? I need to shake hands with someone, right? I need a pat on the back and so do you. And I need to share a bottle of water and have someone share a bottle of water with me. And I want, I want to help train people and I want to be trained by people. I mean, I want to learn from people. I want to help people learn. I mean, we need this with each other. You know, I want a good Irish joke once in a while. You know? I heard some good ones last night. Right? They were good. Okay, awesome. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, I get, we got to get Patrick to do the Irish accent. He's got a great Irish accent. Look at that. <laughs> Stop it, man. Stop it. <laughs> but you're right. We need to get connected, and we also we got to get out of our shell, everybody. We got to get out of the shell. So if we're sitting inside here right now thinking, ah, this is kind of I don't know about this. Okay, that's fine. But a lot of you are thinking to yourself. Yeah, this is good. We need this. We need this kind of powwow to get this sort of thing. Okay, so today's the day to act. Because what you're not going to like is a couple of days from now, you see each other, someone in the grocery store, and go, hey, you were at that, uh, that thing at the church, right? Yeah, 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 with the crazy guy with the, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You buying pickles? Oh, I got some ketchup. Oh, yeah, yeah, Hey, have a good day. You too, yeah. Hey, when the apocalypse happens, yeah, okay, you bet. I'll drive away going, maybe we should have done something more. You know? So yeah, take advantage of it. However you all want to do that, because I got a, I got a plan to lead tonight, and, and I hope and pray that you guys will take it from here and just start, start, you know, open a can of uh, ketchup, whatever. Uh, you know, and get it done, make it happen. Okay, so uh, let's start again. Community. We talked about community. Um, and you know, I want questions to be like ongoing. You think of a question on any topic, just throw it out there. Let's just keep it rolling that way. Um, the, fo the four tiers we talked about, three days, three weeks, three months year plus. Obviously with the amount of time we have, and you know, our course is four, five, six hours of video and links and talks and conversations, so we can't cover everything now. I want to hit a couple key things. The five main areas, food, water, shelter, medical, and defense. Just remember this, there's like a, what's called a rule of threes. You can go three minutes, approximately three. Three minutes approximately without oxygen, and you die. You go about three days without water, and you die. You can go about three weeks without food, and you can die. And all of those deaths will be horribly miserable. I mean, suffocation, three minutes, uh, it's just not, nothing's pretty there. Uh, dehydration, you can get sick and vomit, diarrhea, and so forth, and be taken to the hospital by the end of day one and have to get an IV if you don't get fluids in you. When a baby gets sick or kids get sick, we run out and get a Pedialyte and this sort of stuff, right? Because we've got to get electrolytes in and liquids within a day. Imagine what happens day two, day three as you're dehydrating. Water, 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 water. Rule number one, focus on that if you have one. If anything else prepped, get water. How do you store the water? Various ways you can do it, obviously, and there are multiple things. I'm just hitting some of the top ones. Um, whatever you store it in, uh, whether you store it in glass, you risk glass breaking. Store it in plastic containers. Try to make sure that they're BPA-free plastic. BPA-free plastic is, is either it doesn't leach at all or depending on the quality of it and the company and such, very little leaches, chemical of the plastic leaches into the water over time. Extreme heat and extreme cold avoid when you store your water. All right? You want to keep it in moderate temperature and try to keep it in a darker area so it's not out in sunlight as we mentioned earlier. Yes, sir. How do we know what BPA looks like? Is that like are these little water things? Yeah, you'll see it on the containers. This water that I buy, essential water, um, yeah. Chuck Norris water, by the way. <laughs> right? He's got his own water line out there. You'll see, you look back in there, it's always down in this area here where it'll say BPA, BPA free. So, and you'll see it on your containers. I mean, I'm going to refer to the course that I have uh, because the course that we have, we have links to these things. Uh, there's a couple of container brands that I really like. Reliance is one. You can get it from like a Walmart. It's a seven gallon container. They're blue. They stack pretty nice. I've got them at my house filled with water. Um, they have a six gallon and a seven gallon. There's also a great brand out of Canada. I imagine that in Canada. Great brand out of, I'm just kidding. I gotta get from Canada. Um, called Scepter. S-C-E-P-T-E-R. Scepter. It's military quality level. I mean, you could drop them and throw them, and they're, they're really, really durable. Um, they're a little pricier. Um, I, when I bought them, we bought them from BRC. It was two containers, five gallons, well, 20 liters, so roughly five gallons, um, $105 for two. Okay, and that was a deal. <laughs> Individually, they're like 56 or 58, whatever. You can get five gallon, you can get two and a half gallon. 
My Jeep in Texas, I don't go anywhere without five gallons of drinking water in a separate container in the back of my Jeep. Right. I change it out every several months, you know, you know, in case I, you know, water, you know, purify, get, you know, cleaner water if I want to. But I've always got water filters on me all the time as well. All right, and that's my backup at all times. Even in my backpack, I have a mini Sawyer water filter. Um, so the water issue, again, you want to talk redundancy, two is one, one is none. I like 10 or 15 when it comes to means of purifying and making sure that you have access to water, whether you're storing it or whether you've just got a filter with you. I keep it in a Ziploc bag here. And I, I, showed, I showed you this one uh, earlier, I believe. It comes with a syringe, and that's to backwash the filter so you can clean it out. It's got a little straw thing in there and a little plastic reservoir, which is really difficult to use. But they threw it in there. This is an older version. But this can screw right onto the top of this right here. Okay. So if I've got a good water bottle that the threads line up with, I can fill this water bottle up with river water and then just go like that. I'm good. Okay. It's, it, this type of thing, a Sawyer Mini, they have different sizes of Sawyer, um, and they have Life Straw. That's another really good brand. Again, all this is in our course and then some. But Sawyer, good, good brand. They're used in third world countries. Um, How long will that last for how many gallons? This, they asked actually on their website, it says it goes through like, it's like 10,000 gallons or something astronomical, which I don't, I don't believe that. It, it depends on the water. Like if you're putting this kind of water through a filter, not a big deal because the water doesn't have any gunk in it. You take river water or pond water, lake water, and you've got any kind of larger matter in the water, that will plug up those filters, those pores in the filters much quicker. Keep bandanas with you in your go bag, a bandana or a tightly woven piece of material. And then you've got, if you use that when you're scooping water out of a lake or a river or a pond, strain through something like a bandana, obviously then you need a receptacle to, re to receive the water. In my Jeep, I keep a collapsible bucket. And you buy these at camping stores and it extends out, collapses. Stores nice, and then I'll just, I can drink the bandana over the top of it. And I've done this, we've tested all this stuff. We, everything I'm talking about, we do, we've done. And pour the water through that, you get a lot of the large matter out of the water. And then that water in the bucket, I can pour into a bottle and then I can go with something like this, okay? Now that, that filters the water. Um, this doesn't necessarily purify it. This doesn't take out viruses. Um, viruses are much smaller than a lot of the pores on your standard, like Life Straw and Sawyer Minis. Catadine is pretty good about some viruses. I think they advertise that. But the one that really advertises taking out viruses is Life Saver. And if you're gonna invest in good water, look, trust me, if you're gonna put 300 bucks into your entertainment, 500 bucks or $1,000 into a good TV, but you don't put, you're not willing to put 300 bucks into a good water filter like a Lifesaver type, um, then I, I would just recommend you rethink your decision-making paradigm. <laughs> to quote a line from a movie I heard once. Um, like, I got my kids, we got a great TV, water shut off. Oh no, let's watch TV as we dehydrate. <laughs> Right? No, I do my lifesaver. It was 300 bucks for the five gallon jerry can with the filter that'll filter out viruses to the point of the smallest virus, um, polio virus, is estimated at like 25 nanometers. And the filter on the lifesaver, the smallest, is 15. That's the poor size of the filter on a lifesaver. No, you won't be watching TV if you're dying right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, but the, the, the point is, what our priorities, we've got to get our priorities straight, you know, and we, we, we invest money in the craziest things. And people say, well, Doug, I don't have money for this kind of stuff. And I always ask, do you have any streaming networks like Netflix or Amazon and so forth? And they all do. Yes. Say, so, well, how about you cut two of those out and just go with one yes. <laughs> so you can get your Amazon in or your Netflix or whatever you choose. And, and then take that other money, that 10, 15, 20 or 30 bucks a month that you use and set that aside and that's your, that's, your, that's your prep money and that's the stuff you're gonna put into food and water and shelter and medical and defense. Start prioritizing this stuff. And again, people will look at it this way. This is the mindset thing we talked about last night. The mindset is, it's probably not gonna happen anymore. <laughs> no, it's probably not gonna happen. Oh, dad, I don't gotta be careful of a parking lot. No one's probably gonna jump me in a parking lot. You know, all it takes is one horrible thing, like a fire and you didn't have some batteries in your smoke detector or you didn't have an escape plan. You never taught your kids the escape plan. You didn't have a fire station in the hallway of your bedroom. I mean, I never wanted to be, I hated the idea of being in my bedroom and a fire breaks out in the hallway somewhere. 
I can't get to my kids. I always had a fire station right better, but still do to this day. I want to use that fire station as a tool to get through, to get out and get loved ones out. But it only takes one thing. Water, 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 water. Oxygen and water. Well, oxygen's probably pretty covered. Even in a crisis, we're still going to breathe. But without water, you got three days roughly, and those are going to be brutal, hellish three days. Honestly, they will. Yes, sir. Do they have any kind of water filter with like ultraviolet light in there for viruses? They do. They have some. I've heard good and bad about those. That's one I haven't gotten into very much. I've heard good and bad about those. Yeah, and, and, do, and you know for a fact, I mean, have you tested to see if it's effective? Or you have, it is effective? Good. They got recommendation here. Uh, water leaf, she says. And it's an ultraviolet, using ultraviolet light to deal with bacteria and viruses in the water. Yeah, it's built into the system. Is it like a house system for yours? Yours is built into the house, okay. And they have they have portable systems as well, like for camping and things like that. It's all it's an ultraviolet um, type of um, filtering purification system. If you do a search for that, you can find that. That is one thing BRC has not looked into very much, um, but it is uh, definitely out there on the market. And I'll say this: what is coming out on the market for these types of things is constantly changing and improving. There are knockoff stuff that I don't like, though. There's some stuff that's pretty cheap, uh, so you definitely want to check your reviews. But some brands started off great and kind of waned, and then like anything in life, and some started off eh, and got better. Uh, so definitely read the reviews and check them. But the brands that we have used and like, LifeStraw, Sawyer, Catadine, Lifesaver is definitely one of my top favorites. Yes? What about a well and converting it to a hand pump? Yes. Yeah. If you've got a well and it's electric, and the grid goes down, you know you're not going to get that water out. A lot of people are going to hand pumps, and some are going to, and I like this as a major, it's a major investment, and it's backup battery stations with solar panels. Um, and you can get them mounted on your house, and I don't. And the reason mine aren't mounted is because I want to be mobile. And if my primary source of shelter, one of our five category, food, water, shelter, medical defense, my primary shelter is compromised for whatever reason, and I gotta bug out and move to shelter B, C, D, or E, it's maybe in Texas, or maybe it's in Florida, or maybe I'm coming to Michigan because I made friends with some of y'all. Rory says I can come hang out with him and help raise those big, long, hairy cows he's got. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if I've gotta move, I wanna take some of these items with me. So since you brought up battery power, let's discuss that for a moment. To me, that's right up at the top of the list of things that I want. And I have several backup battery stations that are solar powered. The two brands that I really like, and there's good brands out there, EcoFlow is a good brand, and Four Patriot has a pretty good brand out there. I like Blue Eddy. One word, B-L-U-E-T-T-I. -I. I like them, and I like um, Jackery. A Jackery is, is, I like their build. I like the way it feels. I like I can throw it in my Jeep easy enough. The Blue Eddy is a little different to handle. My Blue Eddy is the uh, 2200 watt one, so it can power a lot more and it's 60 pounds. I can, but you get small, I got a small Blue Eddy that's 10 pounds. My Jackery, 33 pounds, 22 pounds, and, a 10, and an eight pounder, all right? And, but your wattage, of course, and the power that you get out of those, you, you know, like my little, you know, 3000 or 300 watt isn't gonna power my refrigerator. But my Blue Eddy will, the 2200 watt one, and even the 1,000 watt one did when we had Snowmageddon in Texas. I pulled the Jackery out and I plugged the refrigerator into it, no problems. How do you spell J-A-C-K-E-R-Y. -E mm -hmm. And again, our course has all the links to these things, but you're getting, you're getting some good free stuff right now. Yes, sir. I have a pond that I designed and engineered and had dug, uh, probably bigger than this room. That would be D-U-G, right? Yeah, past yeah. <laughs> you dug it. Uh, they, they went down 25 foot and they hit three natural springs. So I have, I mean, actually I have more water than you could fit in this room. And your address, sir, is? <laughs> You're not welcome. You're not welcome. <laughs> nice answer. <laughs> but but if, if you have, I mean, it will cost a few thousand dollars and it will take some heavy equipment. But now you have a lifelong supply of replenishable water for you and all your friends and family for the rest of your life. Wow. Yeah. Okay? For a few thousand bucks. Yeah. And that's a great point to bring up. In fact, um, we know some people down in Texas, and they're talking to me and my, my BRC team about finding land with natural springs on it. And that's a great way to, to look at um, a reason that you would purchase some land. 
um, is trying to find when you've got a natural water source coming out of the ground. That's critical. That's key stuff. Again, water, 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 water. Without water, all the other stuff we're talking about becomes far, far less important if we're not able to have good drinking water. That's the beautiful thing about being in Michigan. Yes. Yeah. 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 Honestly, yeah. Yeah. we have great lakes all around us, plus we're sitting on so many aquifers right yes. here. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome, yeah. Um, Wintertime, no power, freeze, die. But aside from that, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> you melt snow, I'm just kidding about that. People lived up here even in the 1800s, I don't know why, but. You know, the coldest place I ever went, the most desolate place I ever traveled to to get a parish mission was Barrow, Alaska. Oh. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a frozen tundra. And in, it was in May, and so the sun was here the whole time. The whole time I was there, it was just it was at this level, went around right here. I was there for about three or four days. No roads going in or out, at the time at least, because the, 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 the frost just doesn't allow roads to... I mean, the airport's constantly being repaired, they said. And, and it's just, it's, I don't even know why people would live there. But they have a major natural gas um, reserve up there that they, they tapped into. So, uh, okay, so back to this. Um, the Blue Eddy, the Jackery, EcoFlow, there's other good brands out there. I'm not going to bust on brands necessarily. i just tell you the ones that we've tested and really like and have used. And friends that I know and power outages have happened. I know uh, one of our BRC members, our, our coalition members, down in Florida when Hurricane Ian hit recently, they, they commented, texted, said, hey, just to let you know, we had water, we had power, because we had our jackery and this and that, and we were good for a while. We didn't panic. Our neighbors were freaking out because there was devastation everywhere, and homes were out of power, and they were panicking, didn't know what to do, and we were ready to go because we had water and power. Those are a couple key things. I like the power issue, the backup part of it, uh, power banks, individual power banks to have with you. Um, you can get some, I like four Patriots, little 10,000 uh, milliliter ones. Yeah, and I like Patriot Ready has this 20,000 one that's like almost the size of a small, the power is small car battery, um, but they're compact. You can charge two or three items off at the same time. They've got solar panels on them. Thing with a power bank though, according to the manufacturers, in most cases, not every single one, but most of them, if it drains all the way out, you can't really charge it fully so easily on just the, the power, the, just the solar screen on it. Okay, it's not made for that. It's made to kind of top it off and keep it juiced a little bit. So you, you charge that thing up and then you keep it out in the sun, keep it on the dashboard, whatever, and that kind of heat helps keep top it off. Um, but these are good backups, okay? Um, my flashlight can be charged easily off a power bank or off the Blue Eddy or the Jackery, so I can always have light with me. The power bank I can throw in a backpack or go bag, and I don't want to show you what's in my Jeep. Wow, my wife laughs. Do you need another light in the power bank? <laughs> it's like ammo, hon. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, but it's great, and you can get uh, you can get great work lights out there. There's a great brand out there called um, uh, Lorac, L-O-R-L-O-L-O-W-O-R-K, I think, Low Work. <coughs> Forgive me if I get that wrong, but it's something like that. Um, these are, and there's a variety of these online. They're work lights and they're emergency lights that serve sometimes as power bank and emergency light with magnets on them. Okay, so you can stick it to the side of a car and they fold sometimes, they got a hinge on them, so you're working on, on changing a flat tire in the dark. You can stick it on your refrigerator and light up your, your kitchen, um, but it can serve also as a power bank. So again, backup power, power banks, lights, there's a variety on the market, get some and have them. If things are dark, especially if you've got kids or grandkids, able to turn on a light brings hope. It's kind of like spiritually when we're in the dark, we need spiritual light. Okay, we also, on a natural level, lighting up a room in the darkness is a big plus. Yes, ma'am? What's a good emergency radio? Good emergency radio? Boy, there's several out there. Um, what, I forget the brand name of mine. I have, I have two or three. I'll have to remember the name. I'm sorry, ma'am. Um, I have... Are they crank or solar or both? Yeah, what I have, yeah, let me tell you what mine is. So big, uh, it's solar and hand crank both. Got a flashlight and an AM FM radio on it. But get. Uh, I don't. I, that's not mine. Yeah, but you want to get a hand crank. I like the ones that hand. They're very, very common. The hand crank and solar. The solar panels on those on those little radios are not amazing though. The ones that I have and the ones I've seen. That's why the hand crank I think is on them because, in all honesty, 
It might be a nice selling point to put the solar little panel in, but the strip is like, it's like an inch and a half, you know, three inches on the top. It's not much, depending on the brand you get. But that crank, that you crank that baby up, you'll get power and you'll get a little bit of a light out of that thing. So I have that in my go bag and I have them in my house as well. So communication with other people, not, not communication with the radio, but hearing what's going on, if we have a radio signal up at all, is gonna be important. And of course, again, it's another form of backup light. So that's a good point. What yes. About ham radio. Ham radios. I look. I think ham radios are great. Uh, obviously, you have the power. If you're gonna do ham radio, um, depends on the circumstances. Uh, right now, you need a ham. You need a license if you're gonna operate a ham radio. If there's a big crisis, I don't think the license is gonna be an issue. <laughs> we just need to communicate. Ham radio is good. You can get smaller ham version ones that are more like a walkie-talkie. Um, and then you get the larger ones. A good friend of mine is a ham radio operator. He's one of my buddies I have lunch with regularly and we talk about the world and prepping and he's all over that stuff. And he keeps telling me he's gonna teach me ham stuff, but I just haven't had time to, I mean, I'll eat the ham, but ham radio stuff, I don't know. Yeah, he's one of the guys that's coming to the camp. I mean, we're, if, if that works, yeah. And by the way, let's make mention of this. You have, you'll have your ideal scenario, your camp, You'll be here, you'll be there, you'll have this, you'll have that. I don't even have my real go bag with me. I got this one that I have to fly with. So I don't have my survival hatchet, survival knife, I don't have all that fun stuff in it. I, I don't have my Jeep, which has my, my little emergency cook stove and all this sort of stuff. I don't have any of that. I don't have my house right now, which has all the other stuff. I'm here with you all. Now, I'm honored to be with you all, and I mean that sincerely, but I don't have my stuff with me, <laughs> all right? So ideally, I don't want things to collapse right this moment. <laughs> Let's wait till at least midnight. That's about when I get home tonight, okay? My Jeep is at the airport at DFW, and I'm gonna get to that at least, and then I feel much safer because I got a lot of gear in there, and so forth and so forth. You might not have your ideal scenario, which is why you've got to have some things EDC, everyday carry with you on a general all-purpose basis. You know, um, what do you carry when you walk out of the house and what do you have on you if you can't even get to your car? So on that point, let's talk about footwear. All right, I mentioned this a couple nights ago. Let's really emphasize this for a second here though. What do you have on your feet right now if you have to walk five miles, 10 miles, 20 miles? You know, um, what kind of shape uh, are your shoes in? Do you have in your go bag, if it's Michigan, and cold water, whatever, do you have backup socks? Um, do you have foot powder? You can get little travel bottles of, for example, Gold Bond foot powder. I have it in my go bag. So if I get in a long situation, put a little foot powder in that sock, help reduce the possibility of blisters when you have long term situations. So, Vaseline, yeah, that's an option too. So you have things like that you want to be thinking about. If I'm at church and I'm in my dress shoes, the ladies you're wearing your dress, you know, and notice I besides ladies, you're wearing your dress. <laughs> in today's society, you know. No, I know you're not worried about that here, but but if you have to on a colder day, you walk out of church and it's Michigan and you got, you know, twenty below or do you get sub zero up here much? No. You do? Okay. All right, so you got that weather. I mean, I know on the prairie we get it because the winds are blowing like crazy. You got a lot more trees up here. Nebraska, it's like we don't have any trees. I don't know what happened to them. But it's just all wide open. So I don't know what everything you got up here. I know my daughter used to live up here, so they, they um, with her husband, and they were talking about, it. yeah, cold weather. And you're just going from the church door to your car. And you get pretty chilly just in that short little walk wearing your church shoes. And then you find out, right down, car doesn't work, got to walk home, and this is all you got on whatever this is for you. So think of your footwear, and at the very least, keep back up pair of pants, um, keep like, I got my tactical pants, I wear them all the time, I wear them around <laughs> Tyler, it's just, I love them, I have a variety of them, but I have back up pair in my Jeep, all right? So if I'm in my shorts on a summer day, or whatever down in Texas, and there's an issue, and I gotta go with pants, I have them. And I have backup socks, and long sleeve shirts, and moisture wick shirts, to block the sun, or whatever, I got the big floppy brim hat, all this, you know, sunscreen, all that stuff is in the bag or in the Jeep, ready to go in case I have to, uh, you know, in any way, you know, use that stuff. So think about when you're traveling, your footwear, pants, backup clothes, a winter time, base layer, extra pair of gloves. Um, if you don't have gloves in, you know, I have gloves in here, um, like mechanics type, mechanics type work gloves, leather palm work gloves. 
have gloves. I'm a big fan of having a lot of gloves. I have three or four pair in my Jeep, I have a couple in my bucket bag, I have a pair in here. Why? Cuts, scrapes, abrasions, splinters, those things can slow you down dramatically. And they can get infected, they can get dirty, they can cause problems, right? You ever get a hangnail or something and it just irritates? You know, there's an old saying about the guy that walked the entire earth and he swam the oceans and climbed the mountains and traveled to the desert. At the end of it, an interview, a journalist or a reporter comes up and says, sir, what was the toughest thing about your journey? Was it the ocean that you swam? No. Was it the desert? No. Was it the mountains you climbed? No. What was the hardest thing about your journey? It's that damn rock in my shoe. <laughs> because it just irritates and annoys. It's that little thing. So how do you minimize the little problems in a survival situation or a crisis of any kind, whether it's walking across town or whether it's a grid down. And so taking care to protect your hands is a big thing because you'll be fixing things, moving things, doing things. And we all know how easy it is to pinch a finger, hit it with a hammer. That could happen even with a glove on, but in general, cuts, scrapes, uh, splinters, those things, um, you limit that. It allows you to be more functional and efficient in what you're needing to do. Yes? Rubber boots, yeah. And what about waders? My son is, does the waiter thing now, yeah. Yeah, he's got the, the come up over the knees, you know. Um, oh, you know I wear, I wear rubber boots here. Oh, do you really? <laughs> and rubber boots are a great option. I don't have them. I know people who do. I've got really good waterproof hiking boots and tactical boots, and i got things like that to draw from. But, you know. Where I live, I'm surrounded with wetlands. Well, there you go. Then do you have, do you have uh, fresh water coming out of the ground here? Because they want to know where to go. Because he's not, he's not giving us his address. <laughs> but, <laughs> but think about your footwear. Think about your circumstances, the geography you might have to walk over and, and appropriately respond to that. Make sure you got a good pair of shoes, extra socks, foot powder, whatever, in your vehicle with you, or in your bug out bag. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, there are, um, <clears throat> what's his name? YouTube channel. I think his name is Skinny Medic. Might be Skinny Medic is his name. If you do a search um, online for um, uh, emergency medical kits, um, we'll take a break here in just maybe a little bit, and I'll look up a couple things and see if I can get it to you, unless you don't want to take a break. Oh, we're already at noon. You've been here almost two hours with me. I was just starting to get tired of talking. <laughs> just kidding. Um, the med kit issue is, I would say, is this. Um, a lot of people will recommend that you build your own. And the reason is because you can buy pre-built med kits and there are stuff thrown into them that you might never use. Um, you can build out the kit, get yourself a really good bag. Um, and these are all online. Med kit, uh, emergency med kits. Um, Skinny Medic is a guy on YouTube. He does, he's like ex-military corpsman and all this and does a lot of good stuff on there. Um, a buddy of mine is a former ranger and is in the medical field. And then my daughter-in-law is a nurse. And, and then we've done talks with, um, I had a former military guy that I did some training with who was a, who was a corpsman as well. Um, you know, actually out there on a battlefield selling people up type of stuff. And they'll say the basic things that you should have in an emergency medical kit are a tourniquet and not just one. Um, for example, if you've got three people in your car and there's a major car accident and everybody's bleeding and you've got one tourniquet, you got to pick <laughs> who gets it. If they would, in fact, all need it. So get yourself a couple of tourniquets. Now, the only brand out there that is ever highly recommended by any of these medics that I've ever worked, talked with or trained with or learned from is CAT, C-A-T. That's with the top brand that I've heard of. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't other good ones out there, but I've heard so many guys who are in this field say, do not get a cheap tourniquet. Because once you slide the tourniquet on and you're cranking it down, um, the strap the crank is on will actually start loosening and stretching, and then you're wrapping it six, seven times. It should be like two, three times, lock it in, write your time code on it, and make sure you check for a pulse because you don't want a pulse on the end. And then people saying, yeah, but then if there's no pulse, then it's not getting blood. It's like, yeah, well, if there's a pulse, I mean blood coming out of the person. You, and this is an area you got to learn about. I'm not going to stand here and try to teach medical stuff because that's not my field. It's not my, it's not my lane. Um, but I will simply say that a good tourniquet and quick clot, quick clot 
You can find this at hunting stores. Hunters know about this, some of them, because if you get shot hunting and you gotta plug a bullet hole or a laceration of some sort, quick clot is coated, it's, it's gauze, and they have some that's just powder, but the gauze is the stuff that I have and the stuff that I've heard more recommended. It strips of gauze with, with, uh, with um, the quick clot chemical on it, and when you stuff it in the wound, you gotta stuff it in the hole. And then what it does is it works with your blood, with the chemical, and clots faster. So tourniquet, quick clot, and the third key thing is a pressure bandage, like sometimes used like an Israeli bandage, is a common name. Israeli type bandage, what it is, is, a, is a, you can get like four or six inch pads, Israeli bandages at least, there are other brands that have similar. And then it'll have like 70 inches of, of uh, wrap and a plastic hook on it. Put it on, wrap it around, hook it onto the plastic, pull it. Now you're now you're tightening it up. Now you put pressure on the wound, and then you wrap it up as much as you need to. The reason it's 70 inches is well, then you put it on a head wound, and you got to wrap it 18 different directions around a round head type of thing, or you got to put it on a chest and wrap it all the way around a rib cage. But with that hook on there, that plastic piece that you wrap it through and pull, now you now you're tightening it down. You got to have pressure on the wound. You gotta plug a hole, put pressure on the wound, but you gotta try to get that tourniquet on, if in fact you can get a tourniquet on, depending on what the wound is. But the med kits, a lot of times, will have tongue depressors and all kinds of stuff thrown in that um, you might never use, if ever. So these guys are normally saying, start with the basics, tourniquet, uh, quick clot, pressure bandage, and then you're gonna need boo-boo kit level stuff, which I have in my bag here, which is band-aids, neosporin type stuff. Um, and then they do make individual suture kits, okay? And you can find those online to put in your kit. Um, obviously, you need to learn how to do that if you're going to sew somebody up, all right? There, and and how, to, how to clean the wound before you do. And all those pieces you can get, uh, and there, there are websites out there that, that that's all they do, is these types of kits and pieces you can add to and take away from. So, yes, sir? Just a, a resource for medical kits is doomandbloom.net. Doomandbloom.net. They have okay. higher level stuff and all types of different. Awesome, good. Doomandbloom.net, he says. Bloom is B-L-O-M. Yeah. Doomandbloom.net. Yeah, search there. Um, and these will lead you to other, other things that are really helpful. Um, think trauma kit. When, you, when you're looking at what we're talking about, it's a trauma type kit. It's, this is, um, you know, again, stop the bleeding, plug the hole, pressure on the wound um, type of kit. Uh, they should be, actually, I recommend even in the church. You know, and that Father never maybe thought about this. I know churches, like my, my priest friend, Father Mark, back in Texas. We have, like, the AED machines, you know, defit machines. Does anybody know how to use those? Okay, well, I hope you're the ones that are here, because most of us don't know. And so it's not a bad idea to have an expert or someone who does know, and then Father say, hey, Saturday morning next week, we're going to be doing a little, let's show you a couple med things. we got a nurse coming in or a doctor coming in. We're going to show you how to operate that AED and this and that. Because in a heart attack situation, you definitely don't want to be looking at the instruction manual. <laughs> okay, turn on power. Power switch. Where's power switch? You know, you don't want to be in that moment. And, and you'll run into, in a crisis, you'll run into what is oftentimes referred to, in a, if you've done races, I've run two marathons and a couple smaller races and some obstacle course races in the past. And there's a term called RDS. Anybody, any runners in here? Any competitive runners? There's something called RDS, race day stupidity. <laughs> oh yeah, you be running down the course. <laughs> You're into it, the sign, big arrow points this way. You can look, what direction do I go? All right, and you just, you know, that's why you'll have people on some of these race courses, okay, this way, right here, and they're still turning this way, all right? So in a crisis when someone's having a heart attack or someone's bleeding out, there's a car accident, something bad's happening, think race day stupidity. That's where the training comes into hand. If I have trained in advance, then when the crisis hits, I am far more likely to respond appropriately. So understanding an AAD machine, understanding uh, if you've got a trauma kit in the church, um, and just in case, out of the parking lot something happens. Um, fire extinguishers, um, these types of things uh, are just good things to start looking at. And, and, and it's happening, people are doing it, and it can save lives. So um, we had another hand up somewhere, yes sir.
<laughs> Daily medication, refill medication. A friend of mine up in Nebraska, his wife is on thyroid medication. If she misses one day, she'll die. I don't even know what the case that she has is, but it's that serious, they told us. So crisis situations, try to find doctors that will give you longer prescriptions. Um, and uh, some will, depending on how, like what your situation is. Like I, I get 30 days at a time. Some people told me I can only get 30 days or 60 days and, and then I have to wait till then before I can re-up the prescription. But if there's a crisis, what, try to find a doctor who will go above that. And there are doctors who will. I mean, if you find the right one, a friend, uh, a doctor I work with, um, he's very much on board with all this kind of stuff and he will help skirt issues legally, ethically, you know, of course, but um, he, you know, to try to help you give a, a larger supply. On the medication issue, there's some medication that has to be, has to be refrigerated. Yeah. Okay, in that case, you have to have backup power. And if you have to get a small refrigerator just for your medication, you can buy the little refrigerators that hold like a six pack of soft drinks or, or beer or something, get those little tiny guys, don't draw much power at all, okay? Get one of those and that's your medication refrigerator. So if crisis happens, that way you don't have to focus on the big, you know, solar battery station running your big refrigerator if you just want to make sure i got this little one here and it runs the little refrigerator and that makes sure my medication that needs to be refrigerated is taken care of but a lot of people don't think about the medication thing the refrigeration part of it so that's something definitely to be looking at immediately cpap machine is another thing for people that have to have cpap type stuff right and you need electricity you got to have a backup backup power power station of some sort there yeah uh we'll go back here first and then over here, yeah. Over here, someone had a question? Uh, well, I'll we'll go her first and then you, go ahead. Yeah. I was just gonna say, uh, I think a lot of us are trying to self-educate on supplementation and food remedies rather than depending on pharmaceuticals. Yeah. Let me comment on that, man. I will, I, this is one thing with DRC we push a lot, and it's one of the hardest things for all of us, is getting in shape. If you want to survive a crisis situation, get healthy now. Get stronger now. It doesn't mean you gotta, you know, be a bodybuilder, you don't have to be a world-class athlete, that is not what we're talking about. What she said is absolutely right. We have reached a point where our health in general on a good day, when we have access to all this stuff, for a lot of people, is poor. Yes, junk food is bad. And I mean, the food that we're eating, the chemicals that are in them, the lack of activity and exercise is really destroying us in many, many ways. And as I mentioned last night, I, I just, and I mean this with all sincerity and all love as your brother here. Um, this is not judgment on anybody and anything in any way. I don't care how injured you are, I'm injured too. I've told you about both my knees. Almost no meniscus in one, torn ACL that's reasonably healed after two and a half years, but still hurts. Hard to kneel, I still try to kneel for communion and I still kneel at mass, hurts. And I still exercise and train. It's not a pat on the back, I'm trying to inspire and encourage you. Don't make excuses. Yeah, I'm too tired, I'm too busy, I'm too hurt, I'm too old. Jack Mullane, anybody? Jack Mullane? Yeah, 96 when he died. Yeah, but he died. Yeah, well, of course he died. With the quality of his life, when he died, the day he died, he was working out, they said. Okay? Juiced. He was a big juicer. All right? In other words, what you put in your mouth affects everything. 80, 90, 75, 80% of your health is your diet. It really is. Exercise and activity is critical because when you have resistance exercise, your muscle fibers, fast and slow twitch muscle fibers, they, they get what they need, and guess what's affected by that? Your balance. So when we get older, and also we start losing our balance, and then we fall, and we break a bone, break a hip, and so forth, people say, well, you get old, that's what happens. It's partly, partly age, but it's partly because we allow the muscles to atrophy. They deteriorate. They do it naturally anyway, but when we don't train them with a weight resistance or a resistance band, or some sort of resistance exercise, they will, they will deteriorate faster. The bone needs resistance. You have two main cells in your bone, osteoblast and osteoclast. 
I don't want to sound like a doctor up here, I'm not, but these little bits and pieces I do know. Osteoblast is the cell, because bones are constantly regenerating just like our hair, and well some doesn't regenerate, it just goes away and that's it. But our skin is constantly regenerating and all of our organs, everything in the body is going through a constant transformation. That's why as we get older, even the structure and shape of our face changes a little bit, all right? And the bone structure changes inside everywhere. The osteoblast cells are constantly trying to pop and grow. Osteoclasts are doing a kind of a, a feeding off of themselves regeneration thing. They will naturally do this. When you're younger and you're active and you're playing and you're moving, that's resistance. And your osteoblasts are going, yeah, we dig this. We're doing something. Osteoclasts is outmatched because the osteoblasts are being stimulated by the physical activity. We get older, we stop moving as much, and then that starts to shift, and then the decline starts to happen faster because the osteoblasts are being left alone because we're not doing anything with them very much. So doing some sort of resistance exercise, it could be the mildest thing. It could be five pound dumbbells, arm curls. It could be, you know, resistance bands are a really good way. I use them. I do free weights and resistance bands in, in, my, in my way room at home. Sometimes I just, you know, the joints are a little sore today, so you know what? I'm just going to do band work, right? Just going to do curls and things. and just There are buku videos out there on how to do resistance band training for people over 50, over 60, and so forth and so forth. It's there. But what you said, ma'am, is absolutely right. If we're not stronger and healthier, everything we're talking about is going to be 100 times harder. Right? And it's not, again, I'm not trying to put pressure on anybody because i got to maintain too. And when you got injuries, yeah, it becomes a real pain. No pun intended. I got injuries. It's a pain to do this. Yeah, it is, literally and figuratively. But I guarantee you, you are investing in something that you will reap the benefits from later. You really will. And you can change your health starting like that by doing a couple simple things. Number one, cut the sugar out or at least down in your diet. Right? When I travel, I have shoulder sugar once in a while. I'm a big ice cream guy. I really am. I love the ice cream. Okay? So that's kind of an Achilles heel for me. But I eat it in moderation. But this is my sweetener. Like when I have coffee and things like that. I mean, I did have a Dr. Pepper last night. But, uh, uh, but I normally have unsweet tea and I put stevia in it. Stevia. All right? Um, it's a natural, this is organic stevia, and I buy it <laughs> in bulk. The health food store I buy it from laughs and says, you know, if this was on the stock market, you would be making money on this. But I buy it and I put it in my coffee. When I'm home, I, I have almost no processed sugar. That has been an enormous thing to help even my joints and everything feel a lot better. That's number one, cut your sugar out. Okay. Second, I would say eat as much organic as possible. All right, because you're reducing pesticides, chemicals. Number three, anything that has artificial colors or flavors, try to get rid of. Now, our general restaurants are hard to do that, but at home, we can. All right, so pesticides, artificial colors, artificial flavors. Notice the word artificial, not real. All right, they don't work well with the biological makeup of the body. And I would say also nitrates and nitrites. Natural occurring ones are different because they're, it's kind of the design of God and so forth, but when they're added to it, and you can get it everywhere. I buy deli ham, no nitrates and no nitrates. I buy sausage, no nitrates and nitrates. You know, bacon, same thing. You can find it out there. So organic, no pesticides. Artificial colors, flavors, try to reduce that and cut out the nitrates and nitrites and the preservative type stuff, MSG, right? Monosodium glutamate and so forth. And, um, and again, cut back on the sugar. You do those things right there, even 50% and you will improve your health. Start incrementally. Like don't go home and go through the cabinet if you don't want to, if you do, fine. But if not, just go, oh, we're throwing out everything. Look at the ingredients. Monosodium blooming, it's gone. Uh, FTC number five, it's gone. Yellow number six, it's gone. You know, blue number one, this is actually what they are. Blue one, red, uh, red 40, uh, it's yellow, yellow five and six, I mean red five, whatever. They, they number them. And we're putting them in this. You realize that Europe is outlawing some of this stuff that we still have. Yeah. yeah. They have outlawed a lot of this stuff that we still have in our foods. Yes, ma'am. God's natural wrapper. That's it. God's natural wrapper. Is that a grocery store? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 
Foods that are made in God's natural wrapper. Yes, that's good. That's good. And another example in a grocery store is the outer walls because normally that's the refrigerated or organic or uh, produce. Anything in the store is going to be boxed and canned, and that's where you're going to have more of the added stuff. But God's natural wrapper is a good way of putting it. Uh, yes, yeah, so, and then you had a question. We'll go back. Let's do her first. I'm sorry. Okay, I just wanted to put a plug in for everybody keeping up with CPR and uh, mm. first aid training. Good. I can't do every six months or so. You know, and then when we're using the defibrillators and all that stuff, it's, it's all part of that. Yeah. And uh, I, I, they interviewed a 115 year old woman, what her secret was, and she said walking. And, wow. Uh, so I just always tell everybody to keep moving. And it's not, I walk a few miles a day, two or three maybe, at least. And it helps my mental health as much as it helps my physical health. Mm -hmm. um, well, the CPR thing is a key one. Let's look at friction and flow on that point for just a moment here. Those of you who in, in this room um, know how to do that stuff, your CPR type instructors, you know, and all this sort of thing, right? And that's your thing, that's your lane, that's your passion. It's like me, what's my passion, what's my lane? It's things like this. It's talks on faith, it talks on breath, right? That's it. Now, back to Tyler, I do basic self-defense training, not Bruce Lee stuff. I want to train the 80-year-old woman to be able to stand and know how to gouge an eye and punch a throat, okay? I want everybody to have some idea what to do. It's not just going to be spinning backflips and whoa, this sort of stuff. That's not my lane. My lane is basic, general, general, general entry-level type stuff. Those of you who are CPR type people or AD, defibrillator people, offer something. Offer it. Talk to Father. Hey, you know, I'm skilled in this. This is what I do. Talk to Rory. He's an organizer. He'll do this stuff. That's it. Then, then contact the groups. Set them up. There you go. And, but the thing is, it's friction and flow. Make it flow. But in anything that we do like this, there has to be a sacrifice. People have to sacrifice, just like you've all generously sacrificed your time the last two nights and today to be here. Um, we have to be willing to sacrifice to do the training and get ready. So set it up, get that flow going so these skills can be taught. Again, the more of us that are even a little better prepared, everybody benefits. Um, and I prefer that over one or two or three people being greatly prepared. I'd rather a lot of people were even a little bit prepared because I mean their mindset's going the right direction. And I just wanted to mention with bicycle riding, mm -hmm. and like I personally have a folding bicycle, so it's easier to take around places. There you go. And I also was a big fan of Richard Simmons. No laughing. He promoted skipping. Skipping. As a, as a good exercise. I always wondered how he did his hair. <laughs> but we know that. Okay. Uh, you here, and then we'll go to you, Matt. Yes. Are you providing any kind of training on alternative medicine, like homeopathy, or tinctures, or herbs? Or your wonderful daughter, I saw her on one. Haley? Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, she is the medical stuff for us. Um, herbal training, tincture, this sort of stuff. We don't actually add that to our course right now. Um, I think she she may have added links to take people to um, like a you know um, another another direction on that um, because we have talked about doing that. If it's not in there, I know it's coming. But we are not skilled in that. Me or anybody on my team is skilled in the herbal stuff. My wife is actually looking at a course right now. Um, and there are courses online. Some of them can be pricey. You could drop a thousand dollars on something, or you can do something for fifty bucks. But there are people who do teach herbal medicine that you could grow in your garden type stuff. Um, there are things out there like comfrey leaf. Anybody familiar with comfrey leaf? Okay, this thing can be used for like a gazillion things. It's just one of those all-purpose type of great things. Comfrey leaf. Comfrey leaf grows easily in most climates. Um, it's that kind of stuff that we need to learn. I would also recommend this. Books, books, and more books. Don't rely just on online stuff. All, right? all the stuff we produce is downloadable, printable. And we encourage people to print them out, create a three-ring binder, and have it written out. Um, because if everything goes down on us, well, obviously we know what that means. We're not going online to get any of this stuff anymore. So get the books. There are survival books. There are repair books. There are gardening books, all these types of things, and I, I have a ton of these things at home that we've collected over the years, and it's just a great backup plan. Yes, sir. One of the things um, for mental last night that you were talking about, mm -hmm. I think if people haven't, especially women, self-defense class. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's probably very, very important for most people, maybe right. especially to take a self-defense class, yeah. because you just panic when you're by yourself. Right. 
Right. So I think that would be very important. And the other thing is the atlas. Mm -hmm. um, when my daughter went away to college, that was the first thing that we got her to go away was an atlas to have in her, and she still has it in her car. Nice. Because that the younger generation, they rely on getting everywhere, yeah. and if the grid goes down mm -hmm. and they can't get to the important mm -hmm. spot where everybody needs to meet, they better have an atlas yeah. and a map. That's awesome. I agree with that 100%. Yes, yeah, you know, I carry two with me all the time. But um, and the, the, the self-defense class, I'll, I agree with that 100%, and I will go one step further and do it regularly, even if it's like every six months or quarterly even. One and done classes can be very helpful, um, but I like more consistent training on things like that so you can build muscle memory. But absolutely, you're right, it needs to be done. Uh, someone grabs you, um, I've done enough Examples, I won't do any right now, they're not really set up for that, but I've done examples where, for example, I had a, a, a young lady come out, I was in a gymnasium, 150 people there, doing a talk several years ago. She came out and her husband was there too. I said, may I have permission just to put my hands on your neck? I won't squeeze against your throat, but I just want to give you an example of something. Yes, you may. So I put my hands on the side of her neck and I just kind of pressed firmly, but not hard, not as strong as I could have, and against the side of her neck, and I said, now, and she had had a self-defense class at one point, and I said, she took a college, I think, and I said, okay, now go ahead and get my arms off your neck. First thing she did is the standard operating, and it did this, nothing moved. Now, I'm, I'm reasonably strong because I work out a lot, but I'm not so strong that, you know, just an average, strong, healthy guy would be doing exactly what I was doing at that point. She couldn't get my hands off. Self-defense classes work because they can help train the mind and they can help give you basic skills. But having it regularly done and learning multiple things over time, one thing builds on another, can be even more effective. So I agree 100% with what you said. I would just encourage you to do it and then do it again and again and again. I was offering self-defense classes for women only uh, back in Nebraska for a while and I would have 20, 25 women show up once a week and we would go through, I had pads, they could learn to punch, they were palm striking, they learned how to drive it out, and you know, not this sort of thing. You know, they learned how to come out and do it the right way, how to guard and protect, how to block, how to break a, a grip on the neck, which I know you're all thinking to yourself, so then what do you do to break the grip on the neck? I'll show you, okay? And so all, there's a couple of things you can do that, that are very effective. Um, and then I would do the same thing. They'd do it for an hour, and then the guys would come for an hour. I'd have 20, 25 women once a week, and I'd have five guys. And I'm not busting on the men again, but there are a lot of guys out there that just really have the attitude. And I look, face it, guys, I know a lot of you don't know things. And it's not a put down. But a lot of guys have that attitude, oh, no, I'll take it on, man. Like, I watch Rambo movies, therefore I know what to do. <laughs> I mean, there are men out there who said to me, I watch enough self-defense movies, Doug, I can do this and that. And then they, then they pull back, tie their shoe. <laughs> One guy told me that. Man, I threw out my back, tying my shoe. I'm only 45, you know? But guys, for whatever reason, we can't get it through our heads sometimes that we really need to learn how to protect and defend. Do you have any of those on your website? Yeah, uh, the, well, the course we offer, yeah, the course actually has a self-defense section. Yeah, and we go through basic 80-20 stands, the general block, and general basic protection. And then we are adding more. We just upgraded it to BREP 2.0, we're calling it. And we just released the first tier last week. And, um, and if you buy the BREP course, just so you know, Awesome, thanks for coming to this. Um, thanks for being so tall, by the way. Because uh, <laughs> you're effective. Um, not the short guys aren't, don't get me wrong, guys. Okay? Uh, but BREP 2.0, if you buy any of our course, or if you bought it two years ago, everything that we add to it, you get. And there's no extra charge. So everything we add from here on out, the price goes up on it because we keep adding stuff, buying stuff, and we've added people, we've had to hire someone new and all, but um, in platforms we're trying to expand to and all. But everything that we add to it, no matter what it is, you get for the price that it's at right now. And I don't even know what the price is right now, so please don't ask me because I, that's, not my, that's not my department. They just tell me uh, what they do with it later. But we have these things in it, and we're constantly working on adding more because we want to keep putting this stuff out there. Okay, so how do you break the neck hole? Yes, oh, go ahead. Do you say something? Well, if we're talking about announcements, I met a gal here yet last night. Her name is Chrissy, and she's from Highland area. But she uh, has meetings at the Highland Fire Station about all kinds of herbals. And, uh, so I'll give you her phone number. Uh, Chrissy is 
248-330-6428. That's her cell. But she's got a meetup group, meetup.com, Great Lakes Self-Reliance. And I'm looking at some of the activities that she, uh, herbal medicine making. She's going to do some walks on identifying plants in the local area. There's a Michigan Preparedness Picnic in Fenton on Sunday, August 20th. Bush Park, Fenton, and uh, this is their 10th year of doing it, which I live over here today and I don't even know about it. So I think the, the connections we can make here is very helpful. Yeah, that's awesome. And you know, when we're done there, they maybe set some of that back and let people just kind of look at it if you don't mind, that'd be great. Um, anybody want to know how to break a neck hole, a choke hole? Anybody interested in that or do you want to see it? Be curious. Okay. All right, very good. Um, I, mean, I need a, just a decent volunteer. volunteer. Okay, all right, come on down, sir. We'll use a guy. Um, it's just a simple standard thing. I'm going to let you put your hands on my throat. A couple different key things you want to think about. First, if his thumbs are on my trachea, I've got seconds. If he presses with his thumbs on my Adam's apple, my trachea area, I'm going to be in pain fast and it's going to hurt. This isn't necessarily, I want you to hold hard against the side. Don't press on the throat, okay? <laughs> just hold hard on the side. And I can try to block his hands off. And I'm not going full steam, but I'm going probably stronger than maybe an average woman would. And it still doesn't come off so easy. Okay, a couple things I can do. The, the biomechanics of the body, okay, the way we're built, if I just raise my shoulder, roll my shoulder back, this hand will roll right off. And I do that by taking my elbow, tucking it in. I'm not aiming for him at all. I'm just taking the elbow and I'm pointing it at the ceiling like that. Okay, and it rolls right off. Now from here, I can come in. I can strike here. I can drive in here. Now I've created a weapon. So basically, oh, nice and tight, sir. All I'm doing is rolling it up. Okay, I want you to try your hardest to not let me roll that off. You can get it right on my neck. Get your hands back this way. Okay, right there. Tight as you can. And you know what exactly what I'm going to do. It's going to come off. Okay, I guarantee you because it's the way the body works. When it rolls up, you just can't keep it on there. Okay, that's one move. Second move, and remember this. I'm not trying to strike him with the elbow. It's got nothing to do with striking him. It's just, I'm just doing this. You can just all sit there and go like this with your arm, and that's exactly what it is. You're going right up the middle, okay? I'm not trying to push his arm off or anything. A lot of people will do this, thinking, I'm, no, I'm not doing anything here. I'm just rolling my shoulder back by lifting my elbow up, and it comes right off my neck, okay? Another move is this, okay? Get right in front. Uh, actually, get your thumbs on my neck a little bit, because <laughs> I want it to work for them to see. I just don't want you to wait. No. <laughs> Another one is this. Elbow goes up. I turn and I drive it down. All right. Now I've had women. My daughter is like 130 pounds and like five six, and she could do this to me. Okay, it's not a problem. Do it one more time. I'll do it the other side here. It just comes up, and you're driving it down as you twist your body and throw your, your whole, you're twisting to the, to the other side, and you're driving your whole body down. Okay, so again, you're tightening up and using a really key part that you have in your body as a natural weapon, your shoulder and your elbow area. Okay, thank you, sir. Appreciate that. So two simple things there. Now, me showing you. Oh, so you can see it over there? Yeah, sure. Can I keep it one more second? Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I haven't bruised you up yet. I'll bruise you down. Okay. <laughs> so like this then, just work for you here? Yeah. Okay. All right. So the first move was, basically, I'm just rolling the arm up. I'm just pointing right between. All right. He, he knows I'm going to do it, and he's trying not to let it off. Now, some of you guys are thinking, oh, I'm bigger and stronger. I can do it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's the biomechanics of the shoulder. Not biomechanics. It's the mechanics, the engineering of the way the shoulder joint works, that when it rolls this way, you just can't hang on to it. So it just rolls right off. Not pushing against the arm. Not doing anything like that. And the second move is, I'm just going to go up with the elbow on the outside, and I'm going to turn and just drive down. All right? And it's just, and basically his arm, because of that posture, we'll do it slow here, when it comes down, because of the pressure here, notice the pressure that's on the wrist and the forearm area here. He's got a cave, or it might, it, he, naturally, you don't want it to break, you don't want to feel that strain. But it's not even that. The weight and the pressure of all this and me tucking and dropping literally pulls that away from him. He, he just, you can't really hang on. And I've done this with guys that are 250 pounds, right? It's a great move. Another one is this. I want you to bear hug me from behind, okay? Um, now, just get my arms in there, too, okay? So, okay, so now I'm ducked in the parking lot. Oh, no, and I'm doing this thing. He's thinking I'm working the feet, 
okay, and I'm working the finger. Now I got a big. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Sorry about that. I should have war warned you beforehand. I had a 265 pound friend of mine. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. <laughs> he says, Oh, you couldn't do this. He got a hold of me, picked me up, he started walking around with me, and I'm doing this with my legs, and he's got his wide stance. He's thinking, Oh, you can't kick me in the groin. And I was doing all that while I was doing this, and I got a hold of his pinky. And because he was manhandling me, I about tore it off. And he dropped instantly on his knees and was in this posture with me on his knees in a moment. Pinky, fingers, those little things are very, very effective, as you know, right, just now. Yeah. And they work, all right? So you think that kind of stuff. Ladies, the last thing you want to do, guy grabs you, and you're hitting him here. I've done that where I've had a, I had a, a teenage girls or college girls, if my hands are on your throat, I want you to hit me in the chest as hard as you can. And they'll hit me, nothing, right? Hit me harder, and it stings, but it, it's, it's nothing. All right? And it's not because I work out so much. It's just a lot of those guys, she's not going to feel that when you get hit in the chest. I said, but if you hit me a tenth of that in my neck, right, I'll be on my knees choking. And I know that because my sister did it to me. <laughs> Ten years older, she was showing off her self-defense skills. And she went to kick me, and I caught her leg. And I said, oh, now what are you going to do? So she's like this with her leg in my arms. And she went, boom, and hit me in the throat. <laughs> We sat in the living room for like 20 minutes. My mom comes in. Are you okay? Oh, I'll be fine. Give me a second here. I'm kidding you not. Throat, eyes, groin. Yes, ma'am. The, uh, the movie just showed. Yeah. It doesn't seem like they were going to all the ground, though. If they're, if you're on the ground and they're hanging on to you and they got the hands in your throat. You're, you're on the ground with your friend. Yeah, so they're, they're straddled over you and they got you, okay? You go to that eye. You go to that eye. And you push that eyeball to the back of the skull. It doesn't necessarily work in that posture, no. This is where I'm a big fan of have multiple tools in your toolbox when it comes to self-defense. Like, I don't have set plans. Like, I took Taekwondo. And it's wonderful. It's like an art form. And it works in certain cases. I took to Okinawan style, which is the wax on, wax off from Karate Kid. And then when my buddy taught me more of a Krav Maga street style, that was my buddy Chuck, with, I got poked in the eye. They tell you the poke in the eye story, right? All right, that changed everything for me. Your response, your reaction, it's a fight dirty type skill, right? So if someone grabs you around the throat, ladies, if a guy's got his hands around your throat, you poke him in the eye. If you want to just get loose, that's what you can do, okay? I'd just say go for the eye right away. Or the throat, forearm. Your forearm, boom, it's right in here, right in here. Just pop that hard right in here. The nerves in here are so tender, and they got blood flow and oxygen flow, obviously, here. You drop the blood flow down here that goes up the, from the you know, jugular up into the brain, or the nerves in this side, you can knock somebody out. See the old movies, karate chop, and they drop. There's truth to that. Now, I did this with someone the night before he got married <laughs> to my daughter. <laughs> yeah. And, um, He's a jiu-jitsu guy, so we do this kind of stuff once in a while, right? He's my son-in-law. And the night before the wedding, we're over at my house, and a couple of friends are there, and we're downstairs in my weight room. I said, hey, Jess, let me show you something here. Tom, come here. Tom comes over. Yeah, okay. I'm going to do it. It's called spear move. It's a spear move where you're in this posture, and someone throws a punch, and you just kind of come in like a spear, and one arm catches the arm of the punch, and the other forearm just strikes right along the neck. Either side is, right? Standard operating spear move is called. And so Tom knew it was coming. I tried to pull it, right? And so I'm talking to him. So anyways, he's gonna throw the punch, right? Either side, go ahead, Tom, either one. All right, it comes in, boom, and I popped, and I just kinda, it was just kind of a pop like that. Just like that. It's not slamming hard, just a snap pop, right? But it was right here. And then I turned to Justin to explain something, and Tom just went, <laughs> he was out for like three seconds. Tom, he comes back. Man, everything went black <laughs> for just a moment. I couldn't, wow, amazing how it works. There are nerves here. I don't care if it's Dwayne The Rock Johnson, ladies, all right? He's got nerves there. He's got a trachea here. He's got eyeballs here. Doesn't matter who that guy is, how drugged he is, how hellbent he is on hurting you. You drive into the eyes, you drive into the throat, you drive forearm or hand or pit punched with a fist into the neck. You can gain advantage. And you're looking for advantage, so you can turn the tables 
and protect yourself. Get out of there if you have to then. All right? Fight dirty. Fight dirty if you're being attacked. Kick him in the balls. Kick him in the balls if you want. If he's high on drugs, he might not feel that, and that's actually true. Really? Yeah, a buddy of mine, not really a buddy, but a guy I knew in high school got a parking lot fight. He told me the next day, he said, oh man, Saturday night, you know, driving down the road, mouthing off guys in high school. And he pulls into the parking lot of a bank, back smack parking lot there, it's closed, it's like 10 o'clock at night. And the guy gets out of the car, starts walking towards Mike, and Mike's like, Doug, he comes at me, and I'm thinking, this guy's huge, man. This guy's kind of like the guy I just left, tall guy I had earlier here helping out. He said, this guy's huge, and he said, look way over my head. And I just thought, oh man. So the closer he got, I thought, I, I gotta end this fast. Street fight, dirty fight. Boom, he said, I drove my shin right into his groin as hard as I could. The guy stopped, looked at me, and laughed. He said, I kicked him a second time and a third time. The guy, nothing was facing him. He came at me and got a hold of me. And then I went into a punch fight. Three times. Now, he'll feel it later when whatever he's on wears off. But it doesn't necessarily guarantee that he's going to stop it right now. My buddy Chuck, who was in the Navy for 32 years, he said he got a combat situation. He said one time there was a guy coming at him, coming to him and his buddies. And he didn't say who did the shooting, but he said the guy was coming at us. He said, we, this is a terrorist, terrorist. He said, we shot him nine times, center mass, which means torso area, nine times, and he was still coming until we shot him in the head. Because no matter what they're on, the mechanics of the hip bone, when it was blown up by the round that hit the hip, he just physically couldn't stand anymore. So again, it doesn't matter your drugs, alcohol, whatever you're on. If your trachea is popped and crushed, if your eyes are gouged, that affects how you can operate no matter what drugs you're on. So fight dirty, especially you ladies, if a guy's overpowering you. And guys, look, if a bad guy breaks in the house and you're outnumbered or you're overwhelmed and there's two or three of them, <laughs> fight dirty. You gotta save your life and the lives of your loved ones. All right? And this is an area of prepping that we, we address. It's the defense part. Individual self-defense to broader scope. Do you have community built with people who know how to fight? Or want to learn how to fight? Have the mindset that know that they might need to fight. I'm not a warmonger. I don't like fighting. I like diffusing. That's why the posture is this first. Hey pal, let's calm this down. But as the saying goes, it's an old military saying, I may be a nice guy, but I've already killed you three times in my mind. You ever heard that one? No. It's an old military saying. saying. I heard a guy, like a ranger, had a, uh, some officer had it on his coffee mug on his desk. You know, I heard another one too. Be nice to everybody, have a plan to kill everybody. Now these sound harsh, and I don't want to, if you're thinking, wow, this took a turn. <laughs> Pray the rosary, have a plan to kill everybody. That's not what I mean. <laughs> What I'm getting at is if and when, please Lord no, but if and when things get so bad that we're in the position where you've got desperate people or gangs of people, I don't know, Antifa, BLM rioters, who will do anything to loot and riot and hurt people, then have the something in you, if you choose to, it's between you and God and the people around you, because it's also the people you're responsible for. Like this guy back here, his wife, Look at the size difference of these two, right? Yeah, right here. Can you stand up for us, please? Look at this. All right, someone tries to hurt her, and he's standing by her side. Clearly, they're a lunatic, right? You're gonna look at this pretty young lady and go, hey, I'm gonna take advantage of this, and he's standing there, and if he has any idea what to do, like drive a forearm into a throat, gouge an eye, drive a foot into, into the front of the thigh and drop it. If he can do anything like that, he's, he's in good shape. And she feels really good next to a guy like that who's strong and knows what to do. Am I right, ma'am? Yes. Absolutely. Thank you both. So this is, but this is just not what we want. No, we're not all built like this guy. We're not all seven foot eight like this, right? <laughs> we don't all have that in us. Some of us are just five ten, average height, and we gotta work a little harder. And some of us get older, we get injured, and we gotta work a little harder. And that's fine. You know what that does for us? It may, it, it, it develops the perseverance inside. Because I don't care. I could be 103. If someone comes in that door and my wife's being threatened, I'm going at that guy. I'm going at that guy like ugly on a gorilla. I will. Go, I go go through a wall. All right. I may. I may die in a puddle of blood, screaming out. I'm going through the wall. I, mean, I might. I don't know. But inside me, I don't ever want to lose that spirit that says, if an innocent person is being harmed, I got that King David DNA. I'm going to stand in the gap. 
Now, maybe it's through legal action, education. Father does it every time as a priest. He's in the gap between evil and good. He's standing up for good by confronting evil as a priest. He does that. We all need to have that. Men and women alike have that something in us that says, I will stand in the gap. Because if Patrick goes down, Kelly, you might got to protect Patrick. Right? Or just swear at the guy. I don't even know. I don't even know. I don't even know. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You gotta have that mama bear in you, ladies, and let the let the let the claws come out once in a while. But if you know what to do, like the couple things I just showed you here, and they become second nature. Someone comes at you, boom, the stance comes up, and it doesn't go to this, you're gonna be so much better off. So learn basics, self-defense classes, learn a variety of skills. I've learned again taekwondo, different styles, taekwondo, pramaga, basic street fighting. You gotta learn basic skills. And the better you get, the more you'll be able to apply them appropriately so that you can show restraint. And that's the greatest thing, to be able to have that strength and show restraint if and when you need to. Yes? I, I don't, don't plunk me after three days of you, but is there ever a time when you were by yourself, you would discern that it would be better to turn the other cheek instead mm. of defending yourself? He's asking if there was ever a time I was by myself and, over, and I discerned it was better to turn the other cheek than defending myself. Um, Instead of defending. Instead of defending. Um, I, I, can't, I can't think of, like I've only been in a couple of real fights in my life because I've always been able to talk myself out of stuff. You know, I've always been able to say, hey, what? Wait a minute, hold on, no, 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 let's think about this. I've always been able to do that pretty good. Um, I've never had to be in a situation where, that's, where I've had to make that choice, I guess. Um, you know, and, and I'll, one quick story, me and a buddy were you know, in high school and two guys came up and we were talking to their girlfriends and we didn't know that. And my buddy is a little rambunctious and lacks tact to the greatest degree. Walked past the two young ladies and said, hey, how you going? How's it going? And they didn't say anything. And he turned and he goes, okay, fine, we stuck up. We're just trying to talk to you. I said, Jack, come on, man, this isn't good. He goes, no, no, no. He starts talking to the ladies. And they said, you gotta realize our boyfriends are right around the corner. And Jack says, oh, I bet they're like 6'3", 200 pounds, I'll bet, right? Here, the two guys come around the corner, and they're both like 6'6", six, 6'3", six, and they had to be 180 to 200 pounds easily, and we were just high school kids, we're like, oh, whoa, and I look at Jack, good job, man. Right, and they come walking up, bearing down on us, start rolling up the sleeves, and I thought, we are going to get pummeled right now. And this doesn't look like good odds for us. They're older, they're bigger, I just don't want to get into this, okay? And I had a little karate training, but I wasn't very far along at that point. So I just said, whoa, 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 what is this? What is this? You want to fight? Look at you, two big, strong guys. You're defending your ladies. I said, well, that's nice. That's nice. What are you trying to talk to them? Look, man, how good's it going to look to, to them? You beat up a couple of small, oh, this is really going to be impressive. Man, you know what? I got time for this. I ain't got time for this. You want to beat up a couple of small guys? What's that going to prove? I'm out of here. And we just walked away. We got into the alley and started running. <laughs> Jack turns to me and he goes, man, you ever do that again, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> I said, you started it, man. <laughs> but that was just, use your, use your mind. Like I said last night, the best self-defense weapon is your mind. You talk your way out of a lot of stuff if you're clever, and, bring, and God will give you that grace. Remember God says, clever is a serpent, gentle as a dove? That clever piece, remember the clever piece. It's not just about gentle. I think it's, it's bad when we see the saints and they're all shown with like this all the time, because some of those saints were rugged. Right? Some of them were pretty rugged. The story of DeMontfort and punching the guy at the bar. You know, he was he was in the street with a procession of the Blessed Mother statue down the street with people, and a couple of guys came out the bar and started mouthing up, what you doing out there, holy man, or whatever. After this was over, he went back to the bar. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Turns out he ends up getting in a short fight. I guess the story is that he punched the guy pretty good, and the next day the guy was in the next procession. Oh. <laughs> you know? So you have stories of saints that had a rugged side to them. Doesn't mean it was always right. But remember, when they were alive, they weren't canonized saints yet. So they still had their issues and still had confession to go to. <laughs> but in general, a good preparedness mindset is be able to use your words to diffuse and calm the situation. And that's a good defensive measure for preparedness. Um, I know we've got a long time, and I could go a bit more. I, I don't have to leave for two more hours, but I don't want to keep you all that long. Are there any? Let's just take questions of anything. I mean, food, water, shelter, medical defense. We did, we've done some defense. We've done some water, backup power, some of these types of things. Um, you, ma'am, and then you, sir. Yes, go ahead. Why did you go from Great Lincoln, Nebraska, down to Tyler, and how many years ago did you do that? I, 
Born and raised in Lincoln, Nebraska, quick story here. Um, couldn't stand the weather for the longest time. I always wanted to leave the cold weather, but we had family up there, so we stayed the longest time. Um, then I met Bishop Strickland when I was down in Tyler, Texas, giving a talk. I gave a, a, what we called a battle ready rally. So it was a talk kind of like this. It was a one night. It was a couple hours on Marian apparitions and prophecies, signs of the times. And then we took a short break, went to the gym, did a self-defense claim. They, people were very excited about it. Uh, within a week, I was on the phone with Bishop Strickland, and he said, how'd you like to come down here and move your ministry here and do some work in the diocese? Of so I had his support, so that was the main reason we moved down there. And this summer will be four years. Yeah, so. You like it better than Nebraska? Uh, much, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mainly, um, Bishop Strickland is a very good bishop, and with everything happening in the world right now, he's careful, he's clever, but he says things, and I like that. Um, I and I don't like, I didn't like what was happening in the Lincoln Diocese, and I don't want to get into detail on it because I don't want to sound like scandalizing anything. But the Lincoln Diocese is, has had problems and is having problems right now. It's it's struggling with regards to staying strong and faithful in different areas. Um, and then a side note of that is the weather. Um, I, I just, I, I spent my life in 58, I spent most all my life in Nebraska, and the idea of being in Texas, where I like heat, I love heat. I love going and working in my garage when it's 100 degrees outside, I honestly do. Yeah, I just, I love the hard workouts in hot, on hot days. I mean, I was fine with the weather for a while. I worked on a garbage route for two years in Nebraska when I was a kid, when I was a teenager. And, you know, sub-zero conditions on the back of a garbage truck. Ugh. PTSD for that. Okay, so <laughs> at least weather PTSD, if you can have that. Uh, yes, sir, you have a question over here first? Yeah, yeah the comment on power generation. Yeah. So if you covered, like, using your car, like everybody drives around, they've got a car, it's got a gas tank, all you need is an inverter of, of various sizes, mm -hmm. and you have yourself an automatic generator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not for long term, but for short term stuff. Yeah, and I've heard of that. There are systems like that, like you just said. You know, your vehicle, because you've got the, the, your motor then basically becomes your, your generator that repowers your batteries, and, and, and you can do that sort of thing. And that, so those things, systems are out there. Um, uh, it, it, you know, not as common, but is definitely available for you. But you bring up a thought, I want to make mention of the difference between a gas power generator, because I'm sure a lot of you have them up here in Michigan, gas power generators, in comparison to um, to, a, uh, to a, a battery station, a solar battery station, in a crisis situation. A year in hell, gotta recommend it again, listen to it, a year in hell, one year in hell, a year in hell on YouTube. 17 and a half minute version, the voice you can understand better is pretty clear. He talks about generators. Gas powered generators draw attention. They have to be outside, they make noise, you're limited by fuel. If access to fuel is out, your generator's done. They make noise, and he said when people could hear generators, they knew that they had fuel and they had probably other things. Yeah. So basically, you're setting up a flare to any bad guys in the area that you've got stuff. You know, hey, I hear a generator out there. Let's go find it. And whatever else is there, solar backup battery stations are basically sci fi. So you can take your panels outside, you can charge up your battery, your state battery station, bring it back in, and use your battery station through the night. And you don't draw attention. So I highly recommend that you consider that when you weigh the difference there. All right? I'm not opposed to the generators, but you are limited on fuel and you do draw attention to them from those then. So um, here and then there and then over there. I yes. heard Tyler, Texas, they're starting up some kind of Catholic community or not? Tyler, Texas, just north of Tyler, a uh, little town uh, near Tyler is called uh, Veritatis Splendor. Veritatis Splendor is basically a Catholic neighborhood. And they've got, I don't know, 40, 50, 70, 80, 100 lots. I forget what they are, they're various sizes. Um, they want to build an oratory there. They want to, they've got a priest that they already have celebrate a mass out there, the Latin mass that they celebrate out there. Um, uh, 50 or so lots, I forget what the number is, have been purchased. They had to give them away through a lottery because they had over 300 people that wanted them. Um, there have been a couple of glitches along the way, but in general, yeah, it's basically a Catholic community that they're trying to get started up there. Yeah. Yeah, it's been very interesting so far. Uh, yes, do you have a question? How long does the solar generator work on a cloudy day? Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it'll still, it'll still, it, yeah. The thing about solar power is, is the, de the degree of light that's hitting the panel obviously affects the speed and efficiency of recharging the batteries. They do work on cloudy days, just not as fast. Um, if you have multiple panels and you daisy chain them together, link them together, you can actually speed that up. I've tested this on cloudy days in Texas. You, I mean, obviously your percentage drops dramatically. It could be running 75, 80% on it when the angle of the panel is right on with the sun. 
clouds hit it, where the angle changes dramatically, and then it's maybe down 15, 20, 25%, but it is still charging. So it will charge on cloudy days, just not nearly as fast. We have a cloudy state. Second No, I realize that. No, no, I know, I know that, yeah. But my son-in-law was up here with his generator, and he was, it was working for him. So, I mean, it, it, it can be done. Honestly, it's not ideal. Sun is ideal, but bright light, I mean, bright days actually do still work. They're just much, much less percentage-wise. Um, I'm a big fan, again, if you're going to make strategic purchases on this stuff, get more than one. I have four or five now, various sizes from like 250 watt to 2200 watt, right? And I have I had this for a reason. I can barter with them if I need to, or I've got them to cover on a variety of different things. Um, it, it, these are just things, and you know, it, it, you're looking at roughly a dollar a watt ballpark, okay? A little bit more when you add panels to it. Panels can be a 100 watt panel, 200 watt panel, 350 watt panel, you, depending on how much power it's gonna be drawn in. Um, you can get some that are waterproof panels so they can be out for a little bit of rain and moisture. You don't wanna soak them, but they will take a little bit of rain and moisture and snow. Um, so yeah, it could be a, a snowy day, but it's, it's enough, there's enough light out there. You put your panel on, you're gonna collect a little bit of power. Not a ton, but you will get it, so yeah. Uh, back here and then here, yes. Just wanted to mention that with uh, water storage, Yeah, you already have water in there. Uh, on the point of water, let me hit this real fast before we get, we'll go to you and then there. Um, Long-term water storage, different ways of doing it. We talk about BPA-free plastic, definitely I encourage that. You could put, I don't recommend it, but people will put drops of Clorox in their water for long-term storage. I'm not a big fan of that, but it will kill bacteria and things in the water. But then you're drinking the Clorox a little bit, okay? It's up to you. Purification tablets, you can use purification tablets, but again, you got the chemical element in there as well. Or you can use something called aerobic stabilized oxygen, okay? This is a liquid, you can get it in little bottles. Um, you put several drops in per gallon. Aerobic stabilized oxygen. And they're just little bottle, little drops, it's all natural, and it just, it, it adds a little oxy, oxy, oxygenation to the water and helps cut back on uh, any growth in the water. Uh, there's a guy who used, uh, the brand is ED, Good Lows, G O O D L O W E S, I think. You do ED Good, you'll start finding it. And he put it in his water, I believe, if I got this right, six or seven years. He tested it, took it out, drank it, it was fine. Okay. I will say this though if you don't put water purification, Clorox, this and that in it, and you have it in there six months a year, whatever, and maybe you got a little growth of something green in there, whatever, but you have a good water filter, you'll be okay. Right? You invest in like the Lifesaver water filter I talked about that will filter out bacteria and viruses. And then if you're drawing from a lake or a pond or even water that you've stored for two years and you're not sure if you want to drink it right now, just run it through that good filter and you'll be fine. All right? So these are, these are not hard things to get through, but there is a little bit of investment in time to figure out the little details and the nuances of it. So. Uh, but water storage is important. I've got water stored for several years in BPA-free plastic bottles from the grocery store, those little ones, and I drink it tomorrow. I wouldn't have a problem with it. Um, you know, but I've got, again, I've got probably eight to ten water filters at home, partly because we test them, but I want backups, and I want to be able to trade them. If someone comes and, oh, we're hurting, what do we need? We got this, what do you got? We got, we got eggs, right? You give me a dozen eggs, and I'll give you a little more, with so your mini water filter. You know what I mean? You can barter with this stuff to help save lives, all right? And there is a saying, people say, well, just store gold and silver and this and that, and that's great if the financial world goes to the point where you will use it and need it. But if it's a food issue, you can't eat gold and silver, is the saying. So, you know, tuna, <laughs> soup, things like that might also be good to be storing up as well. So you've got that as a means of, of, uh, of trade, you know? And if you've got gardening skills or things like that, you've got chickens, you've got that kind of stuff, you are going to be in good shape, provided you keep them all alive and uh, no one comes and steals them. <laughs> you know? I mean, this is, things can get crazy. You check out that A Year in Hell piece and you'll understand that's just a glimpse of what they went through in the Bosnian War. And that's a small country in comparison to the United States. Yes. I think this country is going to become much more divided than it already is. And I think we're going to see regions of it that are going to be like Florida and Texas, for example, where the governors have put in place laws 
that forbid, uh, as child abuse, mutilation surgery for kids, gender surgery for kids that are minors. It's, it's against the law. Whereas Minnesota makes their state a sanctuary state for gender affirming health care and surgery. And Colorado, I think, just did the same thing. So our country is really showing division in these areas. So we've got to be glued to help hold these things together as Catholics, especially doing these things the right way. Okay, was it you, ma'am, or over here? There, and then you, and then we'll go here and here. Yes? Just a question about international travel. Um, your comments on um, traveling to Western Europe. I looked at the State Department on um, every country, with the exception of, I believe, Ireland and Portugal are on level two. I don't know if that's a big concern. What are your comments? On international travel? Um, I, I, I'm, I just, I'm not going anywhere myself. I've been invited to a couple other countries to speak and all, and I just, I've turned them down right now. I just don't feel comfortable, um, you know, because my responsibilities are here. If someone has to do it for work, that's a different thing. Um, if my wife and I went on a vacation, it was just the two of us, you know, I'm, I'm still with my kids there, my grandkids. And so for me right now, and I'm not a paranoid guy, like, uh, I'm not worried about that stuff, but I want to be cautious, and to me, the, the benefits don't outweigh the, the risks. Um, so I'm not an international travel guy right now. Mainly because things are shifting so quickly at times. Like all of a sudden, um, what was it, Italy? Uh, who was it just recently? Uh, for another story, uh, escaped my mind. Uh, just shut down all, I forget, they shut down something, forgive me. Um, not necessarily had to do with travel, but it was something they did, they did countrywide. Um, in fact, it's food supply or something on that level. It was an infrastructure thing, if I remember right. It's those things are happening more regularly and quicker. Look what Canada has been doing with, with even things like firearms, you know? And with, when the trucker thing was going on and they just shut their bank accounts off um, and they had access <clears throat> because of digital and online stuff. I don't trust countries. I don't trust the leaders anymore. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stay in the States and uh, I'm, I'm ready to stop flying in the States and then next time you all invite me up here, if TSA is doing the biometric stuff, then uh, I'll drive. Okay, and you'll see my Jeep. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll do all this in the parking lot and I'll show you all the stuff, cool stuff I got in my Jeep. So uh, we had back here with you, ma'am, okay. I have a sump tank in my basement and the water fills up. Right. Quite regularly. Yeah. And I think that probably is Um, if you if you if you, you have to purify it, filter it, filter it, purify it. Yeah, um, I would. It would not be my first choice <laughs> because it's down low and, and sitting in the pump here because it's in the pumps in the water with it and all. So you got contaminants from that that are going to be in there. You might have any kind of oils or, or things that might have gotten into it, seeped into it from the pump. Less likely um, in, a, in an emergency situation, depending on how good your pump is and how dirty the water is and how good your filters are. If it's if you got a good system to, to purify the water and filter it out, it could be fine. Yeah, it's just gonna, it, it's just factors you have to consider. The dirt of the water, the quality of the filter. Those are the key things really right there. But so. definitely could be used for flushing the toilet. Oh, absolutely, yeah, 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 that kind of stuff for sure, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, here, and then there, and then we'll go yeah. Hugh Kelly, yeah. Okay, go there. Um, I had a comment <clears> and a question. Throat> on throat> on the, the Clorox throat> in the water to purify it, it's my understanding that the bleach dissipates and just turns into sodium salts so that Clorox flavor doesn't really last. It, it'll clean the water and right. you have clean water. Yeah, I, I've heard that. So, <laughs> it's just the concept of Clorox that I'm drinking and there have been some tests where they've run water like that through like a Berkey filter or, um, and Berkey's a pretty good brand as far as uh, like a filter that you sit on your yeah, counter and all. Right. You know, and that's one of the reasons. But they've done some tests, um, and I've seen different videos. How legit some of them are, I'm always kind of uh, arm's length on. But they have still found traces of this in there. Minuscule, maybe, not dangerous. That's why I say it's not my favorite well, thing, but I would do it if I had it. Yeah. That's not going to happen. And, 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 and drop it in and, 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 and like and give it an hour, and it's going to be cleared up. Right, right. It's like 24 hours or 48 hours to be on the Right. But that's, you know, that's something to investigate. But my question was, um, like your go back, your, you know. Well, I would say, I don't comment what you just said, sir, about everybody drinks chlorinated water. That's true, but it's still not healthy. Every city, everybody in this room is drinking it. Well, I know. Every city puts in their water. Well, I'm not trying to argue with you. I'm just saying it's not healthy. Everybody eats food with red number this and yellow number this in it, and it's not healthy. Unhealthy it wouldn't be either. 
Artificial colors? No, chlorine in your water. No. Well, bacteria. They've done. They've done a foot. Charging after viruses, we're all exposed to viruses continually. Right. And you build up immunity to them too. Natural immunity. Okay. So. Right. If you drink the water you want, sir. <laughs> but it's just. I, I, I just. Well, well that. <laughs> I'm getting worked up about this. I'm just saying, just because there's everybody's drinking it doesn't mean that it's the best thing. It's healthier to drink stuff that don't have chemicals in it. Bottom line, it's healthier to eat food that don't have pesticides on it. Bottom line, healthier to eat foods that don't have artificial flavorings and and overboard in a lot of things too. Well, yeah. Do you know anybody familiar with the digestive tract diseases and problems that have increased since our food and our water have gotten so bad? Like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. I suffered with ulcerative colitis for 13 years. It's related normally to environmental things like what you're eating and antibiotics and viruses and things like that nature. Yeah. So I'm an example of somebody who has to suffer that sort of thing because of stuff that I've ingested somewhere. That has got gluten intolerance has gone up massively because our, our breads and glutens and such have become so horrendous now. A lot of it's GMO now. So I'm just saying, you want to drink it? That's your thing, sir. But I'm just saying that Clorox and fluoride and chlorine isn't healthy for the body. You talk about pure, being able to drink lake water or buying a $300 filter system for putting a teaspoon of chlorine in it. Well, that's everybody. That's the great thing. You can make your own decision. I get, you know, store a jug of chlorine. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to do than to buying a three hundred dollar uh, filter system that you don't have the power to run anyway. Mr. Well, Barry, if I may, you you might have the power if you're the backup battery. Yes, sir. Thank you. I stumbled upon this on the water deal, and that is rainwater coming out of my roof. That collects in the cistern. It's not up here in Michigan. It's another place. But it, I, I acquired this house where everyone in the neighborhood does what I'm telling you. Some have outdoor cisterns that are as big as tall as this room that collect rainwater yeah. off the roof. Yeah. Put it into that cistern, a plastic, whatever that plastic that you. BPA free plastic. Sure it is. But I collect it in my basement in a in essentially a room that is underneath my bedroom that is all sealed with concrete appropriate mm. healthy paint or whatever yeah. proxy that is tolerable for drinking water. And then learn about filters. I've got two or three in the row. And then a UV light that circulates the entire house. Wow. Wow. And I have to, and, and, and also at the taps, filters, and a drinking machine that allows water to be hot or cold that is also UV light. And I'm telling you, it's probably the best water I I have ever anywhere, and I'm on a well too. Nice. Where do you live? And what's your address? <laughs> and, and, yeah, you're all can come. It's in Cat Island, Bahamas, so it's oh. all good. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. I just wanted to I was going to say about. Oh, oh, I'm sure she had one more question, then we'll go to you. Sorry, she was finishing up. Uh, I cut her off, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to finish my question about um, your go bag that yeah. you keep in your car uh -huh. and how you always keep water in different supplies. Yeah. Well, up here in Michigan, it's cold in the winter time and if you're out somewhere and get stranded and you know we can't keep water because it'll freeze right. you can't keep it in overnight you can't keep it in all the time because it'll freeze so what would you suggest to do for water or something like that yeah we, we, we in Nebraska had the same problem you know and I tried different things I tried glass glass bottles and how many glass bottles that like like old mineral water bottles and then once you're empty I just fill it up with drinking water you know, filtered water or raw water. And, and those worked most of the time. They didn't freeze. There were a couple times they froze and broke and things. So then I went to BPA free plastic and that was better. And even if it froze, you know, you, you can still thaw it out a little bit. Even if you got a big ice cube, you've got something that you can start working on, even if you're chipping away at it and just getting ice in your mouth or getting liquid in your mouth. I mean, there are things like that I've heard of people doing as well. Um, the other thing is just to make sure that you're changing the water out. There's a little more discipline to this, but your water goes in the vehicle when you're using the vehicle, and then you take it in the house when you're done. And I mean, normally if you're out during the day, it's not out long enough in the vehicle if the heater's been running in the vehicle. And normally inside the vehicle, it's not going to freeze in that amount of time. And then just at night, overnight, take the water in the house and bring it back out the next time you leave. A little more discipline with that stuff. Call it everyday carry. EDC, I carry my, my, uh, my phone, my wallet, whatever, my car keys, and I grab my water and I just throw a bottle of water in with me so I've got some with me at least. So there are different options like that. And some people just, a lot of why people don't do the prepping stuff and take steps like I just described is convenience. Um, and you know, let me cut real quick before I get to serve on this point, the AI issue regarding convenience. 
Um, you might realize that the AI stuff that's growing uh, is growing so fast that, that by the end of 2023, if not before, we're going to have the access to something called a personal digital assistant. This has all been announced that it's coming out. And a personal digital assistant will be your own personal digital assistant on the phone that knows you. So it's not going to be Alexa. It'll be, you know, Billy or Susan or Shaniqua or whatever you want to call it. And it's going to know you. And the more information you provide to it, it will know you even better. Did you like the Shaniqua one? Back to talk one? <laughs> Good Irish name. And uh, <laughs> Shaniqua, Shaniqua O'Malley. And so you got to... You got this personal digital assistant, and the example that was given was by a guy, Jeff Brown, who's an AI expert, was talking about this. He says, you know, it's something to this effect. You'll be able to wake up in the morning, let's say, for example, uh, Patrick wakes up in the morning and the AI digital assistant says, so Patrick, probably with an Irish accent, so Patrick, it looks like you and uh, Kelly had an argument last night. This is literally what they say it will be able to do, because it will hear through your phone that you had an argument, and it'll know who Kelly is because it is used to who Kelly is in your life, it's your wife. So Patrick, here's a, it sounds like you and Kelly had an argument. Um, you know, maybe you two should get away at that uh, resort in that, in that hill country you like out down there in Fredericksburg in uh, Texas. And uh, I've already looked into the plane flights and I've already arranged to clear your schedule. Just give me the go ahead and I'll take care of it. That's what it will be able to do. That's, they're saying that it'll be that detailed. And, the, and so in the interview, um, Glenn Beck is asking the guy, Jeff Brown, well, what will it take for it to get there? There'll be more information, right? Oh, it has to know even more and more information about you. But then that all goes into a data bank, right? Yeah. And then AI has access to these knowledge or data banks, which they already do. They're knowing all kinds of things. And then he says, so then people will have less security and less privacy. He said, exactly. Why would we give over more and more of all this stuff? Jeff Brown said one thing, convenience. We like our lazy boy recliners. We like our, we can actually tell our thermostat now. You know, I don't have that. I, I don't have that. It, it, the house that I bought, it's, a, it's an old house and it had somebody installed that and I, I shut the thing down right away. I don't want the thermostat. I don't want a smart thermostat. And it, in Colorado, they did this and they signed up to the power company. When the power company last summer said, uh, we're going to put a limit on your, on your air conditioner. It's 78 degrees, I think is what it was. 20,000 customers. Whoa, what are you doing? They were dictating the air conditioning, te the temperature of the air conditioner in 20,000 customers or so. And when they complained about it, they said, hey, you signed on when you, when you signed up for this program of our thing. It was all sounded convenient, right? Because it's cash back and we'll adjust your cost and this and that. But then we get to come in and tell you what your temperature is when we determine that power supply is short and we're going to make this happen. So giving our freedoms over for convenience or looking at the convenience issue, there's a great quote, and this is a beautiful quote I love. If you become too comfortable, if you think convenience and comfort, you will get soft. Yes. And if you get soft, you will get weak. And if you get weak, you can't fight. And if you can't fight, you die. Mm -hmm. Spiritually and naturally, the weaker we get from getting so comfortable and getting soft, less likely we are to be able to stand up to things no matter what they are. You know, so again, back to the let's let's try to take care of all these issues and look at it as a sacrifice and an investment for something long term, even and not just for us. So, um, did that cover everything for you? Yes. Okay. And then, sir, let's go to you. And then, I'm oh, sorry. Or did who's first? I don't know. Oh, okay. Oh, ladies, we'll go to you, and then we'll go ahead. Um, I just wanted to ask, what do you think about Alexa? About Alexa, I'm, I don't like any of them. Thank you. Yeah, Siri and Alexa, I don't like any of them. And, and the main thing is they're listening all the time. They're on, they're listening. I know. And, and they're storing information constantly. And, and, yeah, they are. I know. <laughs> yeah. Look, if you don't like what I'm saying, you're not, but you look at me like you're upset with this stuff. I, well, that's no, great, but I don't understand you what your point is. I'm telling you cheaper ways of doing things. In, in an emergency, a drop of chlorine works a lot better than a, a $300 I, filter. And I just said, if you want to do it, go for it. I don't want to drink chlorine or Clorox if I don't have to. Well, you're not. It's an emergency. Well, <laughs> do what you want, sir. I got it. I got it. I, I'm, I'm looking at things another way. You look the way you want. With regards to the phones, yes, they're listening. You can shut apps off. You can shut locations off on there. You can minimize what they get. Siri, Siri and Alexa, you are walking into a program where you are intentionally inviting them into everything that you're doing. So they're going to know more. And the data bank providers, the third party data bank brokers who do it for a living have admitted your smart TV is listening to everything you say and do if you turn the feature on. If you don't, and mine doesn't, 
They don't hear nearly as much. You limit. Are we cutting it all out? No. Are we limiting it so we have some freedoms and privacy? That's what I'm saying I want to strive for. You all do what you want, though, but I'm not a fan of Siri and Alexa now. I mean, do you ever see the fact that sometimes you're sitting there having a conversation with your wife? Maybe we should get a new lawnmower. Next thing you know, you're getting advertisements yeah. on for one. Yeah, it's called, it's called data broken. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I never put the question right. in there. So you know what, sir? Let me pose this question to you then, because it sounds like you're going this way, and I've heard this from other people. You tell me if this is what you're doing. Hey, it's there anyway, so why are we worried about it? No, I don't go there. Okay, good, because that to me is a, is, is a defeatist attitude as well. And I'm not saying that's what you are, but I'm asking since you brought this up. I'm the exact opposite. Okay, good. I don't want that attitude for myself. Like General Mathis was one said, kill everybody in the room. Oh, was it him? Yeah. Okay, great. Marine Corps General Mathis. Right. Okay. Have a plan to kill everybody in the room? Yeah. 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 It sounds like a warm hearted guy. Yeah, but God's sort of mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That actually goes back to a, a Muslim attack against uh, Knights of, Knights, of um, uh, Knights Temple. Uh, the history of that. And he said that to his men because the Muslims were attacking with such. Uh, such egregious attacks and lighting themselves on fire that he just said we have to just kill them all because it was affecting the men psychologically and he said we just have to kill them all God will know who is ready and who isn't so the same idea kill them all and God sort them out so again he's waiting here yes do you think AI will get to the point where it can uh, learn and teach other computers to do stuff and become self aware the self-aware is a good question. The where, teaching of the computers is already happening, where, based on the experts, what they say. Where you finally get it to the point where it looks, where it talks to you and says, I think, therefore, I am. And isn't that uh, what God said? Yes, yeah, some actually are. That's a big debate. The self-aware part is a big debate, whether or not it becomes a sentence, right? Where it becomes actually a human quality of conscience and so forth. And that debate goes on. I've seen interviews with the experts, so-called so experts who were talking about that. The part of computers teaching other computers, and even Musk even said, the fact that these could reach the point of building robots like Terminator is definitely possible. Right. So they could create manufacturing plants and they could produce robots and drones and this sort of thing. That's all very, very doable already, that direction. The thinking part is, I mean, they're never gonna have the conscience that God obviously gives us. Is there gonna be a type of awareness? There could be something to some degree, it'll never be human, of course, because that's just not the way God or orders things. But this is a great debate that goes on right now among those people that are in that field. And they all run on electricity, so all you need is one human handling the switch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. the problem is we have people like Klaus Schwab, the new Hitlers and Stalins of our time that are controlling a lot of that stuff. But at some point they will control the electricity too. So, well, so then in the that's movie, the concern. A human being has to be a hero and go in and destroy the evil world. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. If, to, to the protection. Right. You, yeah. watched, you watched a lot of those I movies. watched all of them. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So you have, um, you have, a, you have a Vinnie Sawyer, and yeah. I don't think you have a straw with you. I don't, not yet. But you know you know the weaknesses. You know that it's not going to do viruses, right? And if you're going to walk back to Thailand, mm -hmm. what's your plan to kill the viruses? I don't know if the Vinnie Sawyer does bacteria. It does bacteria, yeah. Okay, so you're covered. Bacteria is metal, things like that. You're just yeah. taking the risk that if there's a virus, you Yeah, either that or I'm just going to boil the water. That's what I was going to yeah. say. That's a simple way, too, is boil the yeah. water. Yeah. That was yeah. number two, but we never got that far. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Where I got intervened. I know. Yeah, you can boil it, too. I mean, there's, there's, there's all kinds of ways. And look, in a desperate situation, you're going to do different things, whether it's food, water, you can eat rats if you have to. The one year in hell, they talk about eating pigeons and rats to survive with it. I mean, you, things can get pretty, pretty harsh, pretty quick. Um, so you just gotta kind of be ready. You but know? you got your other technology, you got your other, your, yeah. in your other, other bug out camp situation. Yeah, I just, you know, you one of the three hundred dollar filter, so you don't have right. to go through all. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that I'm hoping to offer here is information and advice and encouragement to try to minimize the chaos and the problems. Let's do what we can to put things in place beforehand. Let's minimize things along the way so we can reduce suffering. I just, one thing that really always, always kind of bothered me is this attitude, well, we can get through it, but if we can do it a better way so we suffer less, why not do it that way? You know, well, we can fight this battle this way, but if we fight it this way, maybe we can not have as many people suffer and die. So, um, quick question, you sir, and then you know, sir. Two, Carter, I'm a newbie. So, if you've got a natural gas generator, and even 
that all the people died, there was caverns of natural gas underground. Mm -hmm. How long is that going to last? And are you talking about end of days? Oh, I'm not talking about end of days, no. I mean, I'm not talking about... How long are you talking about? A week, a month, a year? Actually, I, I made clear we have no idea. At the beginning of all this, I said, we don't know what things are going to look like or how long they're going to last or how they're going to hit or from what angle. So, I mean, our course in general tries to help people three days, three weeks, three months, a year plus, just to get people started the right way. I mean, they're talking about if the power grid goes down, for example, an EMP attack, the grid goes down. Um, Dennis Quaid's the actor, just did a documentary on it. Um, Dr. Peter Pry, an expert in this field from talking for years, my buddy, who was the, the EOD expert, nuclear fit, um, biological warfare expert, they all said the same thing. If the grid goes down, we will go back to the 1800s. But we won't have the skills of the 1800s because we won't have learned them along the way. We're going back to the 1800s thinking about things like phones and computers. And so it's going to be unknown. Length of time, the appearance of it all. I, I, there's no way to know exactly what this looks like. You're going to die, you die alone, you die together, you still die. But the goal is, again, along the way, just as the Christian message is, we are to care for the poor, care for the sick, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, and so forth. My job, my job, it's not even to make sure you guys are clothed, and yours is to make sure I'm clothed or fed or given water. It's her right here. It's the woman on the other end of the street, my primary right there. That, that's what I've got to focus on above everything else. So, so how long do you think our gas reserves, mm -hmm. underground, under pressure, mm -hmm. with nobody at the switch, is going to last for? Uh, oh, I have no idea. Geologist run question, run question run that I've been, I'm completely out of my security clearance on that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she, you had your hand man back here. You've been very patient, yes. Okay. So I was wondering, um, with everything that we've been talking about and you know, we've brought up about disease and things like that, what about bodily elimination? What are we gonna do if we our toilets aren't working and you know that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, <laughs> there are, I know Joe have lagoons out here, like uh, as a septic system, houses have individual lagoons. No. Okay, in Nebraska we have that. Um, we had that there. So you have underground septic, like if you're a rural area and you're off of the community, you know, water treatment and all. We had outdoor lagoon, so it looks like a pond. Okay, that was my house in Nebraska where they'd have it four acres outside of town. All my neighborhood had lagoons and aerial shots of it. You can just see that some of them are green covered, mossy and everything. Trees grow around them and it's basically like a pond. It's dug out and your sewage pipe, your four inch PVC pipe runs into it and everything's at elevation is just right, so everything flows out, and it goes out, and then it naturally, with air and oxygen, with oxygen and sunlight, it just everything evaporates. And 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 all of your everything, everything, uh, from toilets to uh, to showers to dishwasher, washing machine, everything goes into the lagoon. And that's been a very common system. And you'll see this on the sides of interstates in some places. Drive down Interstate 80 in Iowa, and they have these outdoor giant lagoon type setup for the rest stop, for the interstate rest stop. Um, lined with rocks on the outsides and everything, it's fenced off and everything. It's a natural way. Um, latrines, basically, the old outhouse idea is also very common. You know, dig a hole in the ground, put your outhouse over it, and you know, farmers did it all the time. My grandparents had it in Nebraska, moved the outhouse to another location after such and such time. Um, there are there are compost toilets. There are people who will have hunt. I mean, campers do this all the time. They take compost toilets with them. That kind of thing can happen. Um, you know, you can go so so crazy as to have a five-gallon bucket, two five-gallon buckets. One's got material in it, like wood chips and things that are absorbent, even cat litter. And then you've got the other ones that you can use as your toilet. You can have seats. They have seats that are made that actually fit on the buckets. Yeah, I have that too. It's a, in case I can't get out of my house for some reason. I always say if you're locked in one room of your house for whatever reason and you can't get out for whatever reason for.